Hey, everybody, a very special Christmas Eve twit just around the corner. Doc Searles, a Jeff Jarvis, Steve Gibson, Rod Pyle, and I will talk about the big stories of the year gone by and make our predictions for 2024. It's our Christmas Eve twit next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 959 for Christmas Eve 2023. The Old Farts Gather. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Stamps.com. Get your business ready for the holiday rush. Sign up with a promo code TWIT for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a free digital scale. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter the code TWIT. Well, a merry, merry Christmas Eve to everyone. Leo Laporte here with uh, not quite the last twit of the year. I guess we'll have a best of for New Year's Eve, but the last live twit of the year. And I, uh, as we did last year, we've decided to do once again a reprise of the old farts holiday show because <laughs> there's nothing more festive than a fart. Hello, everybody. Look at these festive hey, people. Everybody. The uh, the. Jingle, jingle, bells, the old <laughs> folks uh, who have been on Twit forever and ever, like Jeff Jarvis over on my right there. He's fallen asleep. <laughs> did you get a, he was in Vienna yesterday. Did you get a good night's sleep? I actually did. I good. actually did, but it still doesn't, still I'm, I'm, I'm tired now. You're on I'm old. We're all old. Time. So yeah, we're all tired. We're all, I think in order to be on this show, you had to be over 60, I think was the. The rule. Oh, I've seen that in the rearview mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Next oh, to you, man. Doc yes. Searles, looking very festive I, I, in North I Carolina. Think I'm older than all you guys. Oh well, I'm, I'm 760 years old. Actually. Are you really? Yeah, um, 76. Yeah, 760. All year. After yeah, 60, it just all runs I mean, together. We just but, but I, help. you know, I, I did, there was one time Scoble on a different podcast told me that I didn't understand Facebook because I was too old. Now and I told him, and I told him, I told him, dude, I've been young a lot longer than you. Right now, <laughs> yeah. so. Well, and I have to point out <laughs> that it's only the olds who use Facebook. Really, the truth is, I know, I, I, I know. This is like you know a few years ago. You say that to young so. people now. You're too young to understand Facebook. Yeah, Doc's, that's probably true. Doc's the host <laughs> of uh, Floss Weekly, longtime editor in chief of the Linux Journal, and uh, an open source maven. And it's so great to have you on the show for the first time. Likewise, this time. yeah, welcome. Uh, Steve Gibson was here last year with his Grinch hands. He's back. Hello. He's a mean one, Mr. G. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Great to be joining you from the green forest. <laughs> the Grinch. In Southern California, it's hard to get Christmassy in Southern California, isn't it? Yeah, we're not even bothering. Yeah. We've, we've discussed it. It's like, uh, it's too much. Yeah. Pain. There's no snow. <laughs> it's the sun is shining. You know, people in bikinis. Drag neighbors in to see the tree. It's like, yeah, no, 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 yeah. Well, well, Doc has got quite a festive uh, backdrop there because he's in uh, <laughs> he's in Christmas. Thanks country. to my sister. My, yeah, my sister. Nice. Uh, this is her Very house. Nice. Very nice. And uh, and she has fiber. I'm on Wi-Fi, but oh, I like it. Got, wow. got 400, 400 megabits both ways. <sighs> Pretty good. Yeah, oh, nice. That nice. must be. Also yeah. with us. <laughs> The Locketus of Pile. I don't, I really, I can't quite understand what's going on. Rod Pyle is here, host of This Week in Space, the uh, editor-in-chief of Ad Astra, the uh, space magazine from the National Space Society. Um, uh, is this your Holly, Holly, Halloween costume left over? I'm not sure. You know, what... No, I, it, it's, it's just for you, Leo, and this is how special I feel this is. So uh, I'm just a disturbed person. I thought maybe you suffered some severe burns and were just embarrassed. <laughs> no, all my damage is internal up here. <laughs> no worries. Well, very nice uh, to see you uh, all. Thank you for spending your Christmas Eve with us and uh, the Twit family uh, far and wide. And uh, thanks to the Twit family for being here. Uh, on the uh, night before Christmas, it's great to have you. I, th you know, normally what we do on these shows is kind of look back at uh, the year gone by, and I thought, well, that's, I guess we could, you know, go through stories one by one. But we've here we've got a panel 
of pe- four experts in their own right. And finding those stories requires work. And, and I didn't want to. Wanna, I the really didn't want to have to go through yeah. all of them. So. <laughs> You, you've outed me, Jeff, which is, by the way, <laughs> Jeff's chief role on This Week in Google. We've gotten so far afield from this from Google on This Week in Google that we've contemplated calling it This Week in General. But <laughs> that's kind or, of... Or our new and magnificent co-host, Paris Martineau, uh, noted that, that friends said, are you on a podcast with your dads? So it's now This, oh, week, in, this week in Geriatrics. Wow. Well, we are glad to have the host <laughs> this week in space, this what? this week in uh, f- open source, this week in security, and this week in general on our shows. Actually, <laughs> let me start with you, Steve, because, boy, you live this life uh, every week. You go through all of the security news, figure out what the hell's going on. Uh, w- tell me about 2023. Was there a trend, a particular thing that happened this year? I mean, last year was the year of ransomware. I guess every year is going to be from now on. Yeah, and so, so as trends go, uh, I think that's the big one. The, we've talked about it on the podcast before. The, the, the fact that it's possible for bad guys to use extortion against enterprises of all sizes and receive payment through cryptocurrency is, unfortunately... A game changer. Yeah, you, you know, we you know, thought for, you and I both. Uh, you did a, I don't know how many years ago you did your show on Bitcoin, and yep. uh, I think we weren't alone. A lot of people thought this was going to be revolutionary, and for people who are uh, unbanked uh, in in, uh, in developing nations, it was going to change our dependency on uh, uh, nation national currencies, nations currencies, uh, and ended up just really being a facilitator. For, <laughs> For bad guys, a money laundering scheme. I guess more than that, I would say it's an illuminator of human nature yeah. in general. Because you Greed. Know, lots of good people have <laughs> yeah. like lost lots of money because it's like, oh, I don't know what it is. Well, okay, stop right there. Uh, but you know, they put their money in it anyway. But but the for the longest time, you and I were talking on the podcast. You know, observing viruses and malware and kind of like well why is anyone bothering why like viruses were just there they were kind of propagating but they just sort of were like proofs of concept there, there was wasn't nothing, anything nothing gain. behind them yeah yes and so all that changed when it became clear that it was possible for extortion to receive money because money drives this all and so essentially we have several decades of computer technology and systems where, eh, you know, we thought it would be good to have passwords. We thought it would be good to have a firewall, but nobody really worried <laughs> about them that much. And, you know, if the firewall was leaking a little bit, oh, well, we'll get around to that later. I mean, so it, it, security was mostly just sort of a thing you said, oh, yeah, we got that. Okay, uh, you know, what next? The problem now is that we've got hostile foreign governments who are protecting groups of of very capable hackers who which is to say you know they're not trying to chase them down and put them in prison they're like oh you're going to go get the US fine have a nice day and and we're seeing groups like there's one Ryuk that's made we know it's they've generated 250 million dollars in extortion and uh, we were talking about a, 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 a different one related to one that that gotten themselves in trouble when they went pro-Russia after the Ukraine invasion. Um, they've renamed themselves and in less than two years have made 107 million. So and we know this because now we're able to track the transactions across various cryptocurrencies at, at, as they move through exchanges. So. Those guys made $107 million. Well, you know, that'll get your attention. And the, the, the point is that we have, we've always had, we've been playing lip service to security more than really having security. And now these chickens are coming home to roost because there is, there are, there's motivation to breach the security that used to be good enough 
even though it wasn't perfect. Oh, so because and, there's because there's real money to maybe, but that but on that yes. uh, on that point. Uh, you know, I've talked to some of our, you know, there, we have some people uh, who are big fans of your shows, like uh, uh, one of them is uh, Grayson in our Discord, who's really got good OPSEC, but he's just an individual. And, and, I, and yeah. I actually said to him a couple of weeks ago, Grayson, don't worry, nobody's attacking you. They're going after the people with deep pockets, right? I mean, individuals well, aren't more at risk, are they? And, yes, so if... So that's a trend. And if, if you said to me, what is the event? What is the thing in 2023 that stands out? I would say the, re the revelation that we are seeing selective decryption of LastPass wallets. So, Oh, yeah. By again, the way, this is the one-year anniversary of, the, of uh, LastPass really telling us the truth. About what happened. Right. They were breached in August of 2022, but it was in December, December 22nd, exactly uh, exactly a year ago, 2022, that they said, oh, yeah. You remember when we told you <laughs> that in August? That we had a little problem. We had a little problem. Well, it turns out it was maybe a little bit bigger problem. The threat, I'm quoting, the threat actor was able to copy a backup of customer vault data. Oh, but don't worry. They're secure. They're encrypted. And that's been a slow burn story all 2023. Correct. Culminating a couple of months ago in the realization that, in fact, those vaults were slowly being decrypted and hacked. And it was tens of millions of dollars have been drained wow. from from people who were using LastPass at the time of that theft. Mm. So that's been a one year long Story yeah. that started this time uh, one year who, ago. Who I was also owns last pass now. How many? How many? God, who knows? What's right. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think I it's, believe they're owned by a hedge fund firm. I think it's an equity equity capital company. Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably where the, you know, I mean, there's no finance expert here, but I think that that was one of the big stories of the last couple of years is, uh, is the especially in media, right, Jeff, where these uh, equity capital companies. Mm -hmm. I've been buying up media properties like crazy. Red Ventures owns ZDNet and CNET and a bunch of other blogs. Uh, and they are not, they don't come from publishing. I mean, Rupert Murdoch's more of a publisher than they are. They come from money. And I, I, I worked with a guy named John Payton, who was the president of, uh, of Digital First Media. Alden, which is the, the notorious hedge fund that now controls most of the newspaper chains in America, John schooled me and the other advisors, and he said all they're looking for is bad debt. They want cheap debt. Yeah. When they buy the cheap debt, they know that they're going to get an asset, or at best, cash flow with it. And they'll milk Bessie until she keels over in the field yep. and walk away, and they'll be fine. Well, um, and the other problem with these guys is they investment. often uh, are heavily leveraged themselves. They usually borrow right. billions to do these acquisitions, which means they've got to turn, they've got to make some money. Cash flow. They got yeah, cash because they've it's got big interest flow. payments. So yeah. often what they do is they, it's a, they're chop shops, they're digital chop shops. They buy these yeah. brands and, and, and piecemeal them out. You, you see it in media like crazy. Look at the. But I don't even know who owns Time Warner Discovery <laughs> these days. Um, well, I can tell you. I can tell you. I mean, Time is is Benioff. Sports Illustrated is the horrible marketing company that that put up the AI stuff with the fake authors. Fortune is a Thai businessman, and the rest went to Meredith, amazing? and Meredith went to um, not Dash Meredith. It's just and amazing. they closed a lot of publications, including my old baby Entertainment Weekly. May it rest in peace. So but, you were. You were go ahead. Can I ask a question, Jeff? When I was in grad school studying this stuff in the 90s, we were alarmed. I think it was Ben Bagdikian's book we were all reading. We were terrified that less than 12 companies owned the the American newspaper landscape, what's <laughs> left of it. How many own the media landscape now? It's a good question. It's few, but but I think Bagdikian and that whole company of, oh, my God, consolidation was the was the wrong thing to panic about, which is what you usually do is panic about the wrong things. Right. They were, they were dinosaurs huddling against the cold of the future. It didn't really matter that they consolidated mm. uh, because they were going to shrink and die anyway. Look what's happened in the last few weeks of popular science. Gone. That's down. sad. How many, how, many you, how many of you old farts read popular science when you were kids? Oh, my goodness. They got inspired yeah, by it, yeah. right? For old farts, yeah. Every, and absolutely. every hand in the studio went up. And popular uh, mechanics too. and yeah. 73 Pop and yep. bite, of course, bite. 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 How many of you still have life. copies of bite? 
I have, I have copies Definitely. of Byte. Absolutely. I, I got side. I have. Uh, I I, I, I broke into the business uh, writing for Byte in 1984. When they did their 1984 Macintosh cover, I wrote one of the first reviews of Macintosh uh, software. That was. My I didn't idea. know that. What did you say? Did you like it? I said it was good. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. it, was, it, was, it was, look, there were four programs you could run on your Mac. Of course it was good. It was something you could yeah. put on your Mac that fit on a floppy. Mm -hmm. Was it Popular Mechanics or Popular Science that published the cover story on the MITS Altair that got Steve Ballmer, Bill Gates... Popular electronics. I electronics. Okay. Electronics. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another long gone uh, title. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, it's interesting Good. to live in an era where print is pretty much gone. I mean, oh. I, you know, 20 years ago, I used to talk on the radio show about the death of physical media and people mocked me. You know, people who love video said, oh, no, DVDs will never go away. Uh, some people still say that. Oh, no, it's the best quality. Uh, vinyl, man. Vinyl. vinyl. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, there's two record stores in town. People are still buying DVDs and vinyl. But really, come on, let's face it. Uh, paper books, newspapers, magazines, vinyl, CD. When's the last time... <laughs> We, Lisa and I were at a Motley Crue concert. Talk us. about old farts. Lisa and I went to a Motley Crue concert, and as char some charity was going around selling Motley Crue's new album on a CD, and we bought one. But I realized <laughs> after we bought it, I, I don't know where I'm going to play it. Not nothing has. I have no CD players. Yeah. B bandwidth yeah. and storage. Bandwidth yeah, you've got to. You've got to. USB A device in a, that will play it in a drawer somewhere. <laughs> yes, I do. Underneath piles of dead batteries and other things. <laughs> Next to the zip yeah. disk exploding yeah. transfer to your jazz drive. That'll help. <laughs> so yeah, you I, mentioned. I, I, go ahead. I was going to say I, was, I, I I I I do this thing where I visit dying radio stations, and there was one in in uh, Palm morbid. Springs I visited a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Are there any that? And it was in a really so nice old studio. That is so is perfect, Doc. <laughs> doing something else. Yeah, but they're. <laughs> it's a whole story there, including the engineer locked us out in where like the, the dog run, <laughs> but out there was a, a, a stack of container boxes that were uh, of the kind you buy at Home Depot, you know, with the doors on top and, and they were full. I mean, they were rotted. I mean, the actual plastic was rotted and they were full of CDs and inside oh there were walls God. and walls of, of open reel tapes. The big wow. reels, the big reels, because they, oh. their programs, they were a beautiful music station for a while doing that. Sure. Um, they would get those in the mail. Like, you get a a, 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 a reel to reel of this week's music. That's exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. You get a big yeah. reel of this week's music. The whole thing, you know, it was all programmed from somewhere else. And, and I mean, it's really sad. I mean, it's still on the air, but um, I mean, radio, I mean, I, I love radio and, uh, but it's it's dying. It's on its radio, way out. Radio had its century. If you if you think it about had it, its century. It had 20, its century. 1923 yeah. to 2023 was the century of radio gone. Yeah, it breaks my yeah. heart yeah. really because I love. That's yeah. how I got in this medium, uh, and I love this medium. And now actually, even podcasting is kind of is kind of fading off into the Boy. distance. It's well. So I'm curious, Leo. So Spotify is just sort of like admitted that you know, they spent a billion dollars on they they blew it. Yeah. Um, so how does that affect everybody else? I mean, oh, we're dying. Has, we're dying out here, Doc. Have, yeah, I know. I just said, I, I don't know how, how dying we are. <laughs> I hope not. It's, it's not it's good. A heart, a heart is still beating, but it's, but it, so is it that the advertisers just suddenly say, well, Spotify screwed off. So to hell with everything. I think it's a lot of what? things. I mean, uh, Spotify began a trend towards programmatic advertising where, Instead of me yeah. reading it at we, you know, early, we started doing this in 2005 and I came from a radio background from Arthur Godfrey for crying out loud. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and wow. so I was doing those, you know, host endorsement reads that, you know, uh, people had done for years on radio and I, I'd started doing it on podcasts. And I think it, honestly, the sad thing to me is I think it really worked for our mm -hmm. advertisers. Mm -hmm. That's all we ever heard. Uh, but that's been replaced because Spotify doesn't do that. Spotify injects ads. And I'll tell you what's really going on. Steve, you can comment on this. What's really going on is mass surveillance. And uh, advertisers, whether it's good for them or not, uh, whether they can prove its value or not, are reluctant to buy ads that don't, they don't have lots of demographic information 
about the uh, the person hearing it, about when they heard it, where they heard it, how long they listened, it's all of that stuff. It's 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 as wrong as it gets. And RSS can't do that. A traditional podcast, we got we know nothing. I know your IP address. That's it. But Spotify, if you listen in the app, they know everything. They got your credit card, dude. So advertisers you know, got used to this idea that we will buy just as they do on Facebook, a select slice of the audience. And in order to make that work, Spotify has to inject it into the podcast as you're listening to it, as you're downloading it. And, uh, you know, the truth is, I don't think those ads work as well. They also, because they don't work as well, they can't charge as much. So it's put pressure on the cost, on the price that we can charge people. People, we actually are doing programmatic on some of our ads because our some some agencies demand it. So there's this kind of, this is a what is what, I know a rising tide raises all boats. What's it? What's it when it's going down? <laughs> Rod, well, you've got a boat. The ship pulls down <laughs> the, the lowest boats. common is the lowest common denominator. Yeah, but and so ring, that's what's the, happening. The ringer does live, live. Uh, like yeah, the, um, Rogan's doing it live, and Rogan, by the yeah. way, gets a million dollars a unit. I mean, he get so it's not all yeah. gone. I think what happened is that advertisers wanted uh, demographic information we couldn't provide. Uh, and secondly, that they kind of, Jeff, you can talk about this. There are, uh, there are trends in, uh, in ad buying mm -hmm. and yeah. the trend right now is buy an influencer buy. And that's why YouTube's doing so well, Billy, hundreds of billions of dollars in ads moved off TV to YouTube this year. That was a well, big, what about trend. your son? He's doing great. And he's an influencer. He lots of influence. Okay. Just between you and me on Friday, uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> He did a stream on Amazon for Cheetos, one hour for eighty nine thousand dollars. You could buy a buy year of advertising on Twit for that. Uh, you could buy the advance for every book I ever wrote. For <laughs> yeah, so Almost. it's great for Henry That's worse. as long as it lasts. It's great for Marquez mm -hmm. Brownlee. It's great for Linus Tech Tips, uh, but even companies like LTT. I just found out they have 200 employees. They have a very successful channel on YouTube. But most of their money doesn't come from ads. They have 200 employees. Half of them are dedicated to merchandising. They make and sell products. So I think we're in a time of flux. And while I'm so glad radio got a century, we're going to get about a dime <laughs> <laughs> podcasting. That's okay. It's been a lot well, it's, of fun. It's like the New York Times... Uh, uh, made fun of blogs, thought blogs were just awful. And then they started blogging and then they got bored with blogging and they'd ruined it. And this is what the same thing happened again. Yeah. The big old media comes in and they um, uh, take over the medium. This is what Dave Weiner complained at the time. I remember that, oh no, don't let him into blogs. It's going to be miserable. And, then, and he was right. As That's ever. by the way, another old fart we should have on this show because he's a classic yeah. whiner. I don't want to make the show be a downer, by the way. I don't want, I mean, everybody thought, oh, a lot of old people, all they're going to say is, you know, in my day, <laughs> things were better. <laughs> it was radio. <laughs> and and there magazine. Was, <laughs> we had Paul yeah. Harvey. We, good day. Good day. Um, so you were talking about Bitcoin, Steve. I was just looking. This time last year, Bitcoin was at forty-three thousand dollars. Oh, so uh, of course the peak was over sixty thousand uh, dollars two years ago, and now it's kind of coming back up. It's at forty-three thousand at, at the time of recording. So, but uh, do you think uh, cryptocurrency it was a flash in the pan, or is is there some staying power? Uh, uh, that. I've always believed that the technology is real. That is the, the fundamental technology of engineered scarcity and this concept of an immutable log. Those are the things that Satoshi invented. And on that was built the idea of, you know, let's make this worth something. Let's just decide that this, that, you know, these numbers are dollars and see what happens. And so so there's no problem with that. The problem, as I said, is about human nature and about everything that then happened when, you know, this new type of tulip was invented, you know, and everyone went insane. And, uh, uh, Isn't that true about all technology, though? It's it rises and falls by the people who use it, you know, yeah. uh, and yeah. I, we're going to talk about AI later. Uh, and, you know, that's exactly the case with AI. It's not the it's not the AI. It's not the Bitcoin. It's the people. <laughs> it's always well, the people. I will. I am uh, on, on the topic of AI and security. I'll just say that because 
technology and the internet and communications is the medium of AI. Uh, I worry that before this podcast is over, Leo, um, <laughs> we're we're going to be looking, and it's been extended past nine nine nine. So you know we have time, and you have a lease for two and a half years. So <laughs> I'll bet you that we're going to see AI being used for penetration. That is, you know, to, to yes. a, an AI has been trained on network vulnerabilities. Yeah. And this thing gets unleashed on the internet and told to go find and penetrate networks. And unfortunately, it will be very effective. What what will make it effective, Steve? What just because it's it's raw, uh, raw power of trying to get it again? Yeah. Again? It, yes. Exactly. You're able to you're able to to brute force it. Um, my uh, my wife Lori is playing a game that she she found out about when we were in Colorado a couple of months ago uh, with, with my sister. It's a New York Times game where there's a there's a grid of 16 words and you have to group them into four sets. Oh, of I words. love that. Connections. She, it is yes, so she's much gone fun. Nuts over it. Yeah. And I looked at that and I just thought this will die on the throne of A.I., because AI would have the ability to, I mean, it, Jeff, in, in the same way that humans can no longer play chess. We had chess for a long time. We lost <laughs> checkers a long time ago. But, you know, now computers I'm still doing tic-tac-toe, Steve. But. Actually, yeah. <laughs> and I, but I have to say, I, I, I think, yes, of course, AI could solve <laughs> connections probably today. Because it's exactly what an, a large language model does is make those connections. Probably today. But just because a computer plays chess better than any human alive, in fact, your phone can be, play better chess than any human alive, uh, including Magnus Carlsen, who's the highest rated player of all time, doesn't mean people have stopped playing. People just... Correct. And it, it doesn't mean... We still mean like playing AI, each other, right? Uh, yeah. And it doesn't mean that AI will replace traditional hackers. But unfortunately, it's probably going to be able to just zip right past them. I mean, eventually, hackers won't bother because they'll just have an AI and they can say, you know, go find me a vulnerability. I want to extort somebody. Well, it's funny because I don't want to a hard left turn here, but go ahead. what happens when AI meets quantum computing? I think it, uh, it uh, like uh, positron and, 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 and it hallucinates <laughs> like crazy. <laughs> So nothing's exact. So this was the I, year. I know the Speaking doc is of, not worried about AI, but I am. Well, we'll talk. Mm. We're going to get to well, AI. Steve, Steve, it's your job to worry. You worry about everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, he made his fortune on it, of course. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, of course. You are <laughs> your worry dot com. It was about a year ago that uh, uh, a grandmaster of chess, Hans Niemann. Uh, was accused of cheating. Uh, he beat uh, the Magnus Carlsen, the, the, at the time the world champion. He's no longer the world champion because he didn't defend his title. But they beat him, and Carlsen got up uh, from the table and said, if implied that he had cheated. There was some yeah. question how he cheated. They now believe he had, well, I, I'll just leave it to your imagination. <laughs> he had a device <laughs> inserted and uh, was was getting uh, vibrations, vibrations, yes. but wow. uh, vibrations. <laughs> that's right. Uh, whether that's true or not, that. that's yeah. been the problem. Yeah. Is that yeah, AI could beat a human. Human to human chess is still very viable and fun. Right. Uh, Chess.com found a 238 percent increase to 102 million that's users it. who signed up since January 2020. Yeah. That's the so, problem. Yeah. yeah, that's the problem. It's not it's a problem. It's humans. Fun. People are doing they it. They cheat. Yeah. And, and if you could figure out a way to get the message <laughs> from a computer, you can even beat the best player in the world. And it, by the way, you don't have to get every move. It's just uh, if you got five. A little nudge. Moves, a little, a little yep. well, it, it, nudge is one word for it. <laughs> Not a little nudge. A little, you know. Little nudge. It ain't a nudge. <laughs> it's, a zap. It's, it's a new definition of riz. <laughs> the word of the year, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, which apparently is much hipper than I am because I had never heard of it. Uh, all right. We are doing your uh, Christmas Eve, and I am glad you decided to spend a little Christmas Eve time with us. Uh, we've done it in the past with uh, great shots of Jägermeister. I think, given our advanced age, uh, and some tattoos. <laughs> oh no, that was new. Oh, what are you drinking, John? I mean, uh, Jeff. I got a little red wine left over from dinner. That's good. How about you, Doc? You got anything? 
to I celebrate. Have, uh, my sisters brought me ice water. Ice <laughs> water. <laughs> oh, <that'll, laughs> before there was actually tea. That'll uh, warm your sometimes. veins. <laughs> but this works. This fine. You're too old. You're too old for inside. caffeine, Doc. It's warm yeah. inside. And this, <laughs> well, grab this a beverage. The old not. farts uh, holiday right. special for Christmas yeah. Eve continues <laughs> in just a little bit. Hey, this week in tech is brought to you this week by Rocket Money. If I asked you, oh, and this is a painful question, how many subscriptions you're paying for right now? Would you be able to list them all and how much they cost? And when they renew, if you had Rocket Money, you would know. If you'd asked me before I started using Rocket Money, I had no idea. And let me tell you, I save a lot of money with Rocket Money by canceling those subscriptions I didn't want anymore. Rocket Money is amazing. I know how much I've got. I know what my net worth is. But the most valuable tool with Rocket Money is canceling those subscriptions you'd forgotten about that were just dribbling money out of your account every single month. Rocket Money. It's a personal finance app that finds and cancels, yes, it does it for you, your unwanted subscriptions. It also monitors your spending, helps you lower your bills. Rocket Money is the tool. It now has more than 5 million users. I've been using it for years, literally years. And it's helped save its members an average of $720 a year. More than $500 million in canceled subscriptions. It found, in fact, it's a little embarrassing, a campaign contribution that I didn't notice had a recurring check mark that I'd been paying more than $720 a month. You can see all your subscriptions in one place. If you see something you don't want, you could cancel it with a tap. You never have to get on the phone with customer service. You don't have to talk them down. It, Rocket Money does it for you. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions. Go to rocketmoney.com slash twit. I love this. I've been using it for years. Rocketmoney.com slash twit. Remember the name, rocketmoney.com slash twit twit we are talking uh the end of the year and as always i like to do at the end of the year i get together with some of my favorite people and we chat about what we've observed here we have four of our best show hosts hosts rod pile of this week in space security now steve gibson doc searles from floss weekly jeff jarvis uh from this week in google doc was this the year of desktop linux uh, and every year is now okay. because, uh, you know, your, your, your phone, well, your, you, you have palm top Linux, uh, with, with Android is Linux. Yeah. But on top of that, I mean, yeah. but on, if you, but you're using BSD, if you've got a Mac, I'm pretty sure. I mean, uh, uh and I, it's and a I Unix. Found, yeah. I think it's a Unix. It's, it's Unix fair. underneath all that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it, actually Chromebooks are doing pretty hot. You yeah. Know, Chromebooks are doing Yay! really well. That's a, Yay! that's Jeff's daily driver. He's a Chromebook guy. Oh really? Your Chromebook? Look at this! You got an Asus Chromebook. Very nice. That's yeah. I, I don't. I'm talking to you on a on a Mac, but there's BSD under all of that. Um, but I, I actually put it out to my um, my core of uh, of co-hosts and got that the big thing this year was Red Hat killing CentOS, which is their that was a shocker. Red Hat, yeah, that was a shocker. Um, CentOS was an moment. enterprise Linux. That was uh, widely prized because it was very stable, right? And uh, you could, you could kind of put your servers on it and count on it. Um, but but Red Hat's and was bought by IBM. That was what precipitated all of this. What is Red Hat offering now? I mean, did they replace it? Well, they well, I I don't fully understand it. I I think what you should do is go to. Hack a day and see what Jonathan Bennett wrote about it. He's the co-host that shared it with me. Love Jonathan. I was trying yeah. to bone up on it. Um, he's great on on this stuff. And I, I, the big question with it is um, is what the, whatever it is they're doing does it violate the GPL in some way? Um, ah. And 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 the, and actually another co-host Simon Phipps had a really good one-liner, which is that uh, licenses don't compile, meaning Licenses are fuzzier than that. You know, they're not, you don't run them like code. It's just basically governance that you try to obey. And, um, you know, and they kind of hold the society together. And uh, it's it's an open thing. I mean, there's uh, Alma Linux and uh, some others that have come along to sort of, and there's issues going on with those as well. So, so that's one thing. Um, 
another is Steam Deck. So that with, for gaming, that's kind of hot. Well, that's um, a good point. That was a that yeah Val, that handheld um, gaming device runs Linux. Although they're yeah, you know Asus yeah. then put out one that ran on Windows. I don't think it's become quite as <laughs> popular as the Steam Deck. I don't know. Um, yeah. The the big thing for me personally uh, is that. And, and just looking back across all the guests that we've had on, um, which are, you know, so far 50 of them, I suppose, this year, uh, there's this sort of generalized concern that as as open source becomes more and more normalized inside companies, that um, and everything's in containers and it's all many levels above uh, the silicon and above the kernel and uh, whatever else you're running. Um that the open source ethos is getting pretty diluted. Um, it's the the hardcore, um, the people who still are with FOSS Weekly every week, <laughs> and before that were with Linux Journal. There's about ten thousand of them, and they're they're hardcore. They care about it, and and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more than that. But there's but there is a kind of a hardcore there, but it's not. They're wizards, and and they're. I think the if I were to summarize what I think I see going on is that there's a muggly aspect to a lot of the development that's going on in open source. Right a now. what? A muggly? Like, kind of, like yeah, muggles? As, as in they're, they're muggles. They're, they're, they don't belong to Slytherin or Gryffindor or any of those. <laughs> <laughs> they're not wizards. They're just normal. Yeah, no, no, no. Every I mean, day. They could do wizardy things. They could, yeah. they could wield the, the thing and make magic happen. It's not that they can't do magic, but the, but the, the ethos of sharing of, of, um, you know, there's this great XKCD, uh, cartoon that shows a, a heap of, of stones that are here. Here's the edifice of the internet. And there's one stone holding up all of the others over here that says, yeah, that's the one. I'm a little, the, I had it pulled up already, Doc, basket. as soon as you started talking. this. I know. Every, yeah. It's one of the classics. It's just, and that's it. <laughs> this is, uh, it looks like, uh, yeah, it's blocks or stones all standing one another, and it's all modern digital infrastructure. And then it all depends on this little slim block that's a project some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining <laughs> since 2003. <laughs> on a two, yeah, a two <laughs> pick. We've talked about this, uh, Steve, on our on your show on Security Now. Um, yeah, this is a problem. I think that these these maintainers yeah. are doing a thankless job. Uh, you've talked a little bit about how some of these repositories, uh, like PyPy and others, have been a place where They're hackers a constant, a constant attack now. Yeah, uh, bad guys trying to put malicious packages in there. In in what we now have the so called supply chain attack, where you attack the software upstream that other programmers are downloading and binding into their projects and out it goes. And of course, a wow. big scare yeah. was the log4j vulnerability that we had. And, and that and that was, a, it, it was a, a heavily used Java library that it turns out in very specific situation and conditions, you were able to, to take advantage remotely of a slight design flaw. And the problem was that this thing had been, it would have been embedded in so many other projects that the good news was it wasn't easily exploitable. And so we didn't see the end of the internet happen, but you know, here it was, it was free. And the guy who wrote it, you know, he didn't make a mistake on purpose, but neither is he paying, you know, bug bounties to have his code checked because you know, the ecosystem doesn't support that model. Well, this and to take it back to what you were saying, uh, Doc, I think it really does come back to the fact that these major corporations, these big money making companies like IBM are kind of taking advantage of open source. They're not putting the money back in. They're not supporting this guy in Nebraska. <laughs> They're not making sure stuff's secure. They're just using open source. Does that seem yep. well, fair I, I to you? I don't think that's entirely fair. I, th I think IBM is. So here's. A little, a little bit of history that I was very amused by. Like, in, back when Linux World existed, back in like the 99, 98, 99, um, the first time IBM showed up there, it was actually just with guys in suits with black shoes. And um, and and they were, As opposed they were to selling what? web Red shoes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> white and shirts, and skinny and black ties. I know what you're no talking about. Like that. I mean, it was those Pen guys. protectors, and, and and they had a they had a they had a, a single booth devoted to something called WebSphere, which is their web server. Mm, right. Not that anybody cared, and 
<laughs> and the next year they had bean bags and Ethernet tables oh, all over boy. the place and, <laughs> and geeks laying around and and they were like they were they were spending money saying we love Linux. And what happened was explained to me by the geeks there, by geeks there, that oh, well, they found that they had several million instances of Samba running on old uh, um doing file and print on old Windows machines that weren't working anymore. And so what and then they did a survey and they told me this. They the 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 guys who are no longer wearing suits and were, you know, pro Linux that they surveyed one of their, um, their divisions, which is why survey the world. They have a big division. It's kind of like they look inside their shirt and say, how are you doing in there? You know? So they said um, they, they tested for five levels of Linux awareness and bottom level was can spell Linux and top level is hacks kernel code <laughs> and found that all 600 could spell Linux and like a fifth of them or something we're hacking, not only hacking kernel code, we're maintainers wow. of the kernel. I wow. mean, and so basically what happened is IBM got, went into compliance with its own engineers. And later Microsoft did exactly the same thing. You know, that Bing ran on on Linux, you know, what else are they gonna run it on? You know, they weren't gonna right. run it on their own stuff. So, um, so what, but I was told a number of times that people at IBM that they, they really, really, really had kind of a species change over this thing. But this is in the aughts, roughly. Uh, and I think that there's, um, we, we were talking about being farts. You know, that Cory Doctorow talks about something called ingenification. Oh, right? my and God. That was the term of the year, by the way. That's Oxford the, that's English the Dictionary the year. And, should have used and, that and, instead of Riz. Yeah. And and I don't think, <laughs> I, I don't think every company in Shopify's, I think, um, right. Uh, WordPress, for example, I think that uh, Matt Mullenweg is doing a fabulous job. He was on with us this year and he celebrates. Yeah, he was source. on my show too. It's yeah, all I mean, about open source. Yeah. He's yeah. all about open source. And, uh, you know, um, you know, they, they, they support RSS. They support a lot of good things. And, um, uh, and, you know, Dave Winder's been working closely with them and, there had there been they saved my blog, which had been at Harvard, and Harvard decided to close its servers. Yeah, it's a great story. And worked really closely with with the Harvard people to make sure nothing got 404 at all. Everything wow. redirects to to uh, to something maintained at Pressable, which is a, a WordPress site uh, hosting service. I mean, good guys, really good people. And I think there are some of those at an IBM, but. I just think when you get big enough and you get far enough away from whatever it is that made that made you cool, I don't know. I mean, it it's there. This is a different story, but this is one that Craig Burton told me um, back when he was alive. That was a time to do it. Um, <laughs> a long time ago, he was. It, it was after he left Novell, and and he said at that time he said, "Well, you know, there's this myth of the uh, in some religion of the giant snake that circles the world, and the trick is to know." for the tail to know when the head is dead because it takes a while. And, and he maintained at that time that IBM's head was dead. Um, I don't think it was, but I think that the more you're dealing only with the big enterprises and that's your entire, you know, um, uh, customer base, you're too detached, you know? And, and I think that obviously I think the kernel's working fine, but the kernel works in everything. I mean, your clock, your watch, your, you know, the door ringer, all that kind of stuff is running on Linux. And, and so it has to run everywhere. And that's kind of an ethos is built into Linux, but I don't know. I mean, it, it, there's a, um, there's a species change that I think, I mean, when I first started out in Silicon Valley um, with my little company, we realized that there were three stages that companies grew. There was new, there was hot and there was big. And there were completely different stages and you had different people really running it at different times. A few could stay through the whole thing, but there's something that comes after big, <laughs> you know, and it's, and you know, ever, you ever seen Jeffrey West on why companies die, why, why cities live in companies die. No, the company it's, it's really good. Look up Jeffrey G E O F F R E Y West. He's the Santa Fe uh, Institute. And he wrote a big book called scale. That's about this, that, that companies are inherently closed systems and we are closed systems. That's how we got old, you know, and how we're all going to die because we're closed systems and companies tend to be closed systems. And I think a few like WordPress do, do their best to stay as open as they possibly can. Um, and, you know, one like IBM, even though they bought Red Hat, it's just not, you know, sooner or later they're 
they're going to die. They're they're going to die like everyone was going to die. And yeah, for a while, time, I think we've thought these companies that the business cycle was over. That yeah, uh, yeah. companies like Google and Apple and Microsoft have gotten so big that they'd actually defeated the business cycle, and that no one could succeed them. Uh, but I think we know now that's not true, right? I think I think it's not true. I mean, we have to. I mean, in a long, it's pretty hard to look at Apple right now and say, how can they fail? You know, well, they can. <laughs> I mean, right. I'm sure they, they sure they can. Well, you know, we thought Facebook would never and fail. And iPhone can, can, I think you can make you an know? argument that Facebook is no longer dominant. I think. Fox uh, doing great. I think uh, AI and. What's doing great, Jeff? Facebook stock. Meta stock. I know. Great. I know. That's, Interesting. I don't yeah, know what okay. it is. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I think AI could unseat Google. Right? Google's still dominant in search effect more than ever. But I think AI could, uh, they think. Google certainly. stock was up 5% today, and I'm guessing that's because of Genesis. <laughs> uh, yeah, Genesis. We, is, yeah. we played a, a demo on Twig a couple of weeks ago. Astonishing. That was mind-boggling. Now It's good. It's good. Uh, yeah, Jeff had I'm to talk to me down. He said, you know, yeah. this is an edited demo, and it's they're show only showing the best results. But it was kind of uncanny. I mean, I, if it's anything close to the way Gemini actually works... Uh, I think we're awfully close to AGI. Oh boy, there's a. You know what? Let's take a break, and then AGI would be a good topic to get into. <laughs> and by the way, Rod, I'm going to talk about space because this was the year of Elon Musk. That's for sure. And uh, yeah, he was one of them. <laughs> and uh, his successes in him, space have only been matched by his failures in social. So we'll talk about both okay. uh, in just a little bit. You're watching. Uh, a very, I think, a very special Christmas Eve show. Doc reminds me, you were on last year. Steve, you were on last year. I, I think we're, in fact, only... I can't forget Steve with the green hands. I know, hands. Mr. Grinch. <laughs> yeah, I hit a chroma key the, button every time he the only, his hands up. The only newbie is is uh, the uh, the metal-clad blueberry over here. He had to fly <laughs> in from a planet far away. <laughs> he know. to get here. The radio signals went out last year, and he said, okay, I'll be there in a year. Uh, anyway, great to have all four of you. Uh, and uh, we will continue in just a bit with the... Holiday special, the Christmas Eve edition of Old Farts at Play, right after this. Hey, this week we are brought to you by a brand new sponsor, Love Having Them, Gusto. You know, running a small business, I can tell you from personal experience, just plain hard. Gusto lets you focus on the joy of running your business. You can run it with Gusto. It's easy to use payroll software, accessible online from anywhere. Gusto helps more than 300,000 businesses. And when you ask, 90% of the customers say switching to Gusto was easy. You get unlimited payroll for one monthly price. There's no hidden fees. You could have multiple schedules and rates. You could have direct deposit. Or you know what? Some people still want checks. You can have checks and you can print them yourself. Gusto integrates with your favorite tools to make life easier. Tools like QuickBooks and Xero and Google and more. You could file and pay all, get this, all federal, state, and local payroll taxes in all 50 states. Three out of four customers say running payroll with Gusto takes them less than 10 minutes. Wow. Wouldn't you like to live with Gusto? Gusto cares about the small business owners they work with. And since money can be tight right now, you'll get three months free when you run your first payroll. Go to Gusto, G-U-S-T-O, Gusto.com slash tech. Start setting up your business today. To our listeners, again, three months free once you run your first payroll at Gusto.com slash tech. Thank you, Gusto. Now back to the show show. We continue with our uh, Christmas Eve Twit special. So glad you're here. Next week, uh, New Year's Eve, will be the best of. Uh, that's when we really will look back at the events of the year and some fun and uh, important, momentous occasions in 2023. <laughs> this, this show really is about you guys. It's about getting together with buddies and talking about things we noticed uh, this year. Uh, Jeff, you seem to take some... Umbridge at my notion that maybe we're getting kind of close to AGI. Uh, first of all, the definition of AGI is pretty squiggly, so I don't, yeah. I don't know if we even know what that means. But uh, but you look at that Gemini video, and I'm sure we'll get maybe our own hands on it sometime soon and, and be able to see how good it is. But it was very very impressive. Uh, do you not agree, Jeff? So Mark Twain 
said that a machine that would set type would have to think. <laughs> and he uh, wasted his fortune and that's went right. bankrupt and lost his sense oh, of humor. Right. It I is forgot said, about that. Yes. Investing in the page machine to compete with the linotype. And it didn't need to think. But that's what we think when we see a machine that does something that we did, that we do. And if it can do that, it must be as smart as we are. It must be able to think. Um, and no, I don't think we're anywhere near a machine with general intelligence that can tackle any task. That does not mean that the Gemini demo isn't effing amazing. It's phenomenal that a machine can do what this is. It's great, and we can do all kinds of wonderful things with it. But this anthropomorphization, did I say that after wine? Um, <laughs> that, that if it, you can say like Zunjichrecht, you can say anthropomorphization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I think is fooling ourselves and is the wrong debate. And this is where, where this is where I think I'm becoming a big fan of Jan LeCun, who's in charge of AI at Meta. He's a voice of reason here, saying, "Calm down, everybody. It's a it's a fascinating machine. It can do lots of things. Yes, yes, yes. But it's not. It's he said it maybe get to cat brain or dog brain eventually. Uh, but oh, it's not but this, this Gemini's doing stuff." The no dog could do, no two year old could do in many cases. This is pretty sophisticated recognition uh, response. I mean, it's kind of, I know, again, it's it could be a little bit hoaxed. We don't know how how realistic this is, but if it is this good, uh, that's a little bit uh, interesting. Well, and but, so I think there's, there's a mistake people do. make uh, worse than anthropomorphizing it, which is saying, well, how did it get there and worrying about the process instead of the outcome. And I think... Yes, and I think outcome matters. I was just going to say uh, to Jeff, if you have a computer that can beat anybody at chess, then you have a computer that can beat anybody at chess. You know, right. The fact that it isn't self-aware or that it can't wash the dishes, <laughs> that seems to me, aside from, you know, like like a whole different issue. So I guess the question is, what what is it that we're asking? That's a specific it intelligence. That, it but seems is it general we, intelligence? Can it, it take any that, task? I can't do any task. I'm good at some, <laughs> and I'm crappy at most. So, so, so... At some point, we're going to get to a place, and I think this is what we're, we're we're seeing, where you know a computer is less annoying than a person, and it could do everything that the person that you ask the person that that you would ask the person to do, the computer can do. In which case, it's a it's a functional replacement for a person. No, not not all people, but you know the annoying guy in the corner, and it doesn't seem to me that we're that far away. Uh, I, I still think we are, but the, the other the other problem here, and this is Leo's least favorite word of the year. Uh, Riz is the dictionary's favorite word of the year. The, Leo's word, least favorite word of the year is Tesquiel. Oh God! And <laughs> so is, we had bets that uh, you would get that in before halfway through. So I, well I, done. I, <laughs> I, I beat it by five minutes. So uh, Tesquiel is an acronym for the various loony faux philosophies that drive these AI boys who think that it's long-termism, it's effective altruism, it's um, uh, 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 transhumanism, rationalism, and I forget what the E stood for, uh, extropism. Um, or effective and, altruism. And, We've got that too, right? Right, yeah. right. And, and so it's their belief that they are the smartest and most powerful people and that they're going to create machines that are going to be smarter than any of us, including them, and that we owe a debt to the future unborn 10 to the 58th human beings, including those augmented by computers. And really, the people today don't much matter. Our only job is to keep everything going for all those future beings. This is apparently a Larry Page's point of view, the founder of Google. There was a great article in the piece in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, kind of a history of how we got here in AI, talking about a famous... Uh, fight, you know, uh, uh, around a campfire in 2015 between Larry Page and Elon Musk. Elon uh, said, we've got to protect ourselves against the AIs. And Larry, Larry said, oh, you're a speciesist. You, you know, it, you, you're trying to protect humans against the next thing. <laughs> and and they're both nuts. They're, <laughs> they're both, both nuts, crazy. I think. Just I do a machine. Think it's just a tool. 
And 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 the problem is the philosophy heads toward utilitarianism and eugenics, where they think they're going to exactly make the exactly. Human being. Doc, what and do you so think? I, what do you think? Worry Doc? about these people. So okay, but but having crazy people doesn't discount the fact. I agree. That we Have some impressive new technology. Right. Don't focus you know, on Im- all of the side but shows. Not human like. Okay, but the fact that we now have a problem of universities trying to figure out whether their students wrote the paper or a machine wrote the paper, that I mean that tells you something happened. I mean something really significant happened. Or it tells you that that teaching students to write dumb essays all these centuries was a really idiotic thing to do and <laughs> we should teach them to think instead. Doc, where, where do you come down on this? Yeah. I'm very oh, curious. Wow. I've come down in, all over the place. Um, <laughs> I come down like an exploded rocket. <laughs> uh, a musk rocket. <laughs> what, what do they call that, Rod? Uh, rapid unexpected. Rapid unscheduled. <laughs> rapid yeah, unscheduled so disassembly. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, I did, uh, on, on, on the university topic, we had uh, Clay Shirky, who has AI in his title as a vice provost at NYU. Wow. Um, at Indiana University two days ago, um, and it'll be up online soon. I can't uh, wait to watch that. That was a great. He's, get. Re- he's so good. Well, Clay, he's Clay's so been good. Clay disappeared ever since he became an administrator. It used to be we had to quote Clay every two days. I know. And now well, he's he, nowhere. He, so he, good he, for he had a lot of quotable stuff. I, one of them is most people put engineering at the end of their titles so they'll get a raise, you know, or engineer, <laughs> you know, prompt engineer, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, and he had some really delicious things to say about not only how hard that is, but also, and I think it's an important thing, how almost fun it is to try and navigate all this stuff because we have this fabulous tool. You know, it's like the PC. The PC showed up and all of a sudden everybody could do far more than a mainframe could and did it far better than a mainframe could. And 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 it was fun. I mean, I I love playing with AI. And I think it's, it's just, I like having a playoff between perplexity in chat gpt and bard and and um I, I actually think the the bing uh image creator is actually better than than dolly even though it uses dolly and i've had a lot of fun with that um but i, I agree with jeff that there's there's a eugenic aspect to this i mean what eugenics mm-hmm. sought to do was improve the improve humanity by um by testing everybody they invented iq tests the holders went geez uh, you know, ChatGPT has an IQ of 40 million. Well, people don't have IQs either. I, and my mother was a teacher. My IQ scores had an 80 point range. I hated school. Sometimes I did really well. Other times I did really bad. There's no such thing as an IQ. You can't, you can't, it's not a dipstick or a thermometer that'll measure your intelligence. <laughs> intelligence, is, intelligence is a human quality, like empathy or hate or love or other things. And machines cannot replicate that, okay? We can use machines to do all kinds of wonderful things, but it doesn't mean that they are us. And well said, Doc. It isn't just that we're anthropomorphizing the machines. We're machinizing ourselves by imagining that we could be replicated entirely by, by a machine that, that has you know, <laughs> general intelligence. I don't think it's artificial. It's real. Um, I don't know how general it is. It can't be general enough to be like one of us. You know, we're, it, it's, it, think about this. It's a human quality that we we forget things in seven seconds. You know, we, we don't remember how we started the sentences or ending or how we're going to end the sentences. We start yet somehow we get meaning across. And that's a remarkably human thing. Um, humor is another one. Uh, uh, Brad Templeton, I think it is on Facebook has been trying to get a, um, uh, an AI to do a, a New Yorker cartoon. Uh, even when he feeds it with the right one liners, it doesn't quite work because mm-hmm. it doesn't get irony. It's that's a human thing. You know, it, it's, so, you know, I, I, I think in, in relief, we will appear to be more human when this thing's done than we did when it started. So this is where our friend David Weinberger, yeah. I think, is so smart. His last book, um, uh, which was uh, Everyday Chaos, I think it was called. It's a wonderful, yeah. wonderful book. And, and what, what David says is going to drive us nuts is that we get better predictions out of the machine than we can make. Because it has so much data and it can it can and analyze it in a way that never could be analyzed before. However, it brings no explanation. Mm. And we expected that we had explanations in the world. We thought we explained things. That's what journalists do. That's what novelists do. That's what historians do. But we're actually full of crap. We think we can explain things, 
And those things that we call accidents or miracles are just things we can't explain. Yeah, but if I ask so a machine, machine what the weather's going to be, I don't care how it got to it's going to rain tomorrow as long as it rains tomorrow. Well, why do I need to know how it got there? Because you're the one who brought up artificial general intelligence as if there's such a thing as intelligence, where I think Doc is exactly right. That's Steve, Steve everybody... we talked about this a few months ago, and you, your conclusion was we are nothing more than thinking machines, so why is it impossible to think a machine couldn't do it? I do believe that, and I think everybody is impatient and that in five years we're going to have an entirely different terrain than we do today. I mean, we're all wondering what this is that has just begun to emerge. And I would argue we have no idea, but it, but it's exactly as you say, Leo, my, my belief is that we're going to create something which, which is very much capable and it won't be biological and it won't work with, you know, neurons and synapses and, and, you know, biochemistry the way our brain does. But I don't see any big bridge. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm not seeing that there has to be a soul, if you want to use that term, in order to have intelligence. I think you'd need a, 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 an astounding amount of complexity. And we're currently shooting up a complexity curve at a very high speed. And I, I think in in a few years, you know, if we had a similar conversation, you know, there would be a, a lot more expectation and and uh, I, I'm not worried. I just don't want to put these machines in control of our future and our, you know, our physical destiny. Because... Don't give them the nukes for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, and don't give them the authority to write humor because it's astonishing. I never realized how complicated and subjective humor was until I tried to get uh, chat GPT to write me space jokes for this week in space. And it, they were miserable. Really worse than your own? Because that's worse a than, pretty worse low than bar. mine and Bennett serves. <laughs> okay, okay, I get it. No, it was just astonishing. And it, but but as you kind of said a few minutes ago, and I'm having a little trouble taking the Grinch hand seriously, but it's they're growing on me. But it's really hard, I guess, to understand the subtleties of humor. Yeah, at least for those models. Yeah, you know, honestly, do we need a, a machine co co comedian? I don't think so. Uh, do, do we need <laughs> do we need machines that could perhaps? improve crop uh, production or do uh, gene folding or create new vaccines yeah. that might be pretty useful and if it can't tell a joke i can live with that right uh, maybe, and yet you know, and yet over the years the, the new technologies seem to have profited most by doing very mundane things for consumers i mean yeah. if you look at the history of science fiction you go back to the 30s and 40s, and what do you see on the covers of all those pulp magazines? Huge government-supported projects of cities <laughs> in the sky and airplanes that can hold 2,000 people going hither and yon and so forth. And what happened is it didn't all get bigger. It got smaller, and it went private instead of state-owned, and it became people doing kind of mindless and significant things. Actually, I'm not surprised, though, because if you think about what we think of as ancient history, the stuff that survives is those giant monumental projects. Those are the things that live on, um, not the subtle, uh, you know, intricacies of humor and human interaction. A thousand years later, those are lost in the sands. Well, so tomorrow I'm having lunch with a guy I admire greatly named Andrew Pedigree, who's a, the dean of book historians now. He started the universal short title catalog that, that, that catalogs every known thing printed from 1454 to 1750. Anyway, so what, what they catalog is the things, the things that exist are the things that we didn't care about and put on a shelf and preserved. The things that got used every day right. got lived to death. Right. Loved to death. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Those don't survive. Um, I'd like to actually, we started talking a little bit about Corey's doctrine of insurtification, which uh, that's by the way, I say it that way because I like to bowdlerize our conversation. But uh, I thought that was really one of the most important uh, important essays of 2023. Corey observed that companies, and he uses Amazon as his example, it's a, it's a perfect example, start out uh, 
acting in the interest of the customer because they need to build a customer base. And they focus very much on that. That's stage one. Stage two, they start focusing on the businesses. In the case of uh, Amazon, the third-party sellers, to build up that. And then stage three, they cash in on the structures that they've built and it results in uh, disappointing both the customers and the third-party sellers or the businesses they do business with, uh, but they do it in, in, in favor of profit. And this seems to be a trend every, universal in technology. And while I said earlier that the business cycle has disappeared, it seems to me the insurification cycle has only been amplified. We're living in that right now. Doc, you agree? Yeah, I... I, I it it's it's astonishing to me, but not surprising. An interesting slight difference there that um, Jeff Bezos, who I thought did a really good job early on of insisting that the customer was the most important. They'd, I think somebody told me they would have a cutout of a person that would be in the boardroom or the different rooms that they had conversations in that would represent the customer, the customer would always to be there. And now, you know, all the meaningful stuff that's in anything you search for is like way, way, way down below. And you have to read between the lines. And um, that's I mean, a perfect a example. The marketplace and, and they're screwing people on both ends. They're screwing right. the poor people that have to advertise in order to become a sponsor. You get the sponsor result. We saw it with Google too. You know, they started with a few ads on the right side they, and, you know, and now the ads come on, in, on top and they push all the meaningful stuff down e even off the page. Um, it's, so Corey it's, writes, uh, this is how platforms die. And you could use Amazon, you can use Google. He used TikTok in his, art, in his essay. First, mm -hmm. they're good to their users. Then they abuse their users to make things better for their business customers. Finally, they abuse those business customers, and by the way, regular customers, to claw back all the value for themselves. And I left out the fourth step, then they die. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it starts all over. Corey's argument is this is normal. This is the new business cycle. And and what it what we should call for is the ability to jump from platform to platform. That as soon as they stop you know caring about us, we should be able to take our data uh, and move somewhere else. He this is his argument for interoperability, which I, I completely agree with. It also goes back to what Doc said earlier. The, I, I've looked up this book and put it in my wish list. It's about the problems of scale. It's the problems of mass. I talk about this all the time, mass media. But once we, once scale became the expectation, once bigger became the issue, you needed everybody in your audience to sell up to the advertisers, then you were never big enough. And that's what leads to that. And and so how do we return to a human scale? Um uh, you know, we talked about this on Twiglio, where where are we going to have a next Twitter? No, I hope we have a next hundred Twitters and a thousand Facebooks. And and we return to a human scale in all of this. And that's where open source, I think, can serve us well. Yeah, it, it does feel like uh, maybe this is just, you know, old fart talk, but it feels like we're being leveraged. Like in exactly. every every direction exactly. you turn, like you know YouTube, you know they got me. Now they're incre they're increasing the price, and now Hulu wants to do the same. And and you can't buy this; you have to subscribe to it in order to get it. And and it's like it's like this feeling of you know everything I want to do is taking as much from me as they can. Uh, w w which you know takes away this sense of joy and like oh i'm getting a deal it's like no the deals are gone well and yet you, what's what's you, puzzling to me though is with bezos and musk in particular you've got these two very wealthy business leaders who have ab in some ways i i'm saying subjectively have brutalized their business to the point that my experience when i go on amazon to buy something if it's not from a manufacturer i know is basically terror trolling because I don't know what I'm getting at. Yeah, it's very and risky. Yet, yeah. And yet both these guys are very public in their desire to save the human race. And I <laughs> and I believe them. I really do. I mean, I've talked to both of them in person. You know, Bezos's big vision is move all polluting, dirty industries off the earth into space, save the earth, make it a park. And he's now preparing to give away the bulk of his fortune, looking for places to do that. So I'll do whatever it takes in a possibly, let's say Musk in this case, in a possibly morally ambiguous way to to make these fortunes, if he can even do it with Twitter. 
and yet then turn around and do some amazing stuff that that does benefit the larger. I, I think it's the Andrew, it's a head scratcher to it, me. It's the Andrew Carnegie cycle. Yes, yes, it's a it's guy like, who it's made like robber his. Baron. Yeah, he it was uh, a robber uh, baron. Don't give Bus that much credit. No. <laughs> Well, he's, I don't give Andrew Carnegie this, much credit. I he think he didn't want to go to hell. And he, so he, true. Well, he built I, a lot of libraries. I think crazy. The, I, mean, crazy. I think they're losing it, actually. I agree. Yeah, I right. think they're losing I, it. I think there's detachment yeah. going on Maybe here. one I mean, more than the other. They're yeah. talking to a mirror at this point. And Bezos, Bezos is a guy. Surrounded by yes men. Yeah, Bezos is a guy who did, in you know, completely enabled that insurification cycle at Amazon and then took off with his helicopter flying girlfriend and his rocket penis shaped rocket ship and, oh, and no. he's spe he's no irony there <laughs> he's, he's late stage uh billionaire at this point uh, i do want to take a little break cuz i think we we you know we got to talk elon <laughs> we got to talk elon and i'll let Absolutely. you kick that one off uh rod because elon is such a weird contradiction of things of everything in, in every and respect, he wasn't, he wasn't up until he bought X. I mean, he yeah. bought well, Twitter, and this like, and that was the story of 2023. He bought X late in 2022, and this entire year has been <laughs> the year. He of, was interesting <laughs> and almost lovable, and then all of a sudden he turned into this. Oh my God, wacko! Is that I mean, because just, we suddenly well, see oh, him for what he is? Wacky. I yeah, don't know. That's Let's, probably it. I mean, that's probably what it was. I mean, it it it, it opened it opened a, a a valve of bile directly at everybody, and it was like, whoa, <laughs> that's what's in there. You know, like, oh boy. Let's <laughs> well, close that bile valve for a moment. We want to take a break. We will come back. Okay. <laughs> we don't want to spray people too hard. Uh, you are watching the nineteen. I'm sorry, night. I almost said. Now there it is. I'm an old fart. Wow. The 1923 <laughs> edition of the Old Farts <laughs> Christmas Special. Uh, we will be back with more in just a bit. <laughs> you know, every holiday uh, show we have a great sponsor. Perfect time for the holiday. Stamps. dot com. I think for more than 10 years, Stamps.com has been with us on our holiday show. And there's good reason. You want to add Stamps.com to your holiday wish list this year. We all make mistakes. If you've forgotten, it's okay. I forgive you. But don't forget now. Stand, do it. Trust me. We've been using Stamps.com for more than a decade. It saves us so much time. Stamps.com has been helping businesses like ours, maybe like yours, save time and money during the holiday rush for 25 years. Easy access to United States Postal Service and UPS services, premium rates for all your postage needs, you save, you get discounts you can't get anywhere else. The holidays are hard enough, but it's nice to make things easier than ever with Stamps.com. We've been telling you every holiday season since 2012. That's a long time. If you haven't tried them yet, what are you waiting for? Stamps.com offers premium discounts and supplies, and they're right there on your computer. No need to get up and go to the post office or anywhere else. If you're running low, you can order shipping and mailing supplies, labels. You can even get printers from the supply store. But don't worry, you don't need a special printer, special ink, a postage meter. All you need is your existing computer and printer. And, it, and you can do everything you could do at the post office with Stamps.com. In fact, you can even do it on mobile. Taking care of orders on the go is even easier now. Stamps.com's got a mobile app. If you need a package pickup, no problem. You can easily schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. And if you sell products online, Amazon, Etsy, eBay, let me tell you, it, it just makes you, it levels you up. It makes it look so professional. And it makes it so easy for you because Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. And that means you don't have to type in the address. You don't have to put your logo on it. You don't have to put your return address. Stamps.com does it all on an envelope for packages for every kind of mailing. Give your business the gift of Stamps.com so your mailing and shipping is covered this holiday season and beyond. Sign up right now. we got a promo code that's great for you. Go to the Stamps.com website. Click that microphone in the upper right-hand corner and enter the code TWIT. You will get a very special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, a digital scale, no long-term commitments or contracts. This is a great trial offer. Go to Stamps.com. Click the microphone at the top of the page and enter the code TWIT, T-W-I-T. Thank you, Stamps.com, for making our holiday a little bit brighter. 
the old farth, farts have gathered, <laughs> and we are <laughs> sitting around the fire, which is a potentially explosive situation. Jeff Jarvis is here from this week in Google, the wonderful uh, a man I've admired for years, Doc Searles. I mean, I admire you all. I love you all. But, Doc, <laughs> I read the Clue Train Manifesto and tried to foist it on tech TV executives to try to explain to them why they had it all wrong. I bought every one of them a copy. Uh, and uh, we're so pleased that Doc has been uh, with us uh, as the host of Floss Weekly. How, when did you start doing that? How long have you been doing that now? I think it's now going in four years. Wow. Maybe it's more. I don't we know. started, I mean, Chris DeBona and I started that show. He was the open source maven at Google. Uh, way back in the day, I think 2006, 2007. Chris is great. What's he doing now? I know he uh, left Google. It's a good question. I, I, I got to look him up and yeah, find good him. Good guy. Uh, oh, of course, Steve Gibson, who uh, is the continues to be the host of the number three show on the network. <laughs> Uh, we did, we did, and he's, he's aged a little bit. His hair's turned green, but he is still, <laughs> it, it's the second show on the network. Was it? Lisa's telling me you were the second show was twit security. Now. Yeah, I guess that's right. Uh, and yes, you, you asked me during one of our breaks in Vancouver, when we were shooting call for help, you, you were, you were leaning on the set and you said, so how would you like to do a weekly podcast on security? And I said, a what cast? <laughs> and, you, and you said, you've never heard of a podcast? And I said, no one's heard of a podcast. And here we are. We've all heard of podcasts now. Yep. It's amazing. 15 years and out, you know. Radio got 100 years. I don't get it. Uh, no, we're going to, you know what? I love podcasting. I think one of the things that's great about podcasting is we can bring these voices into you, your space, into into your ears, into where you are, and have these great conversations. People, they still have to mow the lawn and listen to yeah, something yeah. while they're while they're pushing the lawnmower or or or, or driving to their job. Washing the dishes, or, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and so you know, we're really good filler. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you have Help such those high people go to sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, our newest old fart. You know, you're only here because. I thought for years you were like much younger than me, but it turns out we're the same no. age. No, I'm a month older than you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know how he looks so young. I guess those treatments are working, but uh, <laughs> uh, just don't get me closer to the camera. <laughs> Radiation. <laughs> Rod Pyle from This Week in Space. So, Rod, you have in your uh, role as a, as a uh, space journalist been uh, covering Elon since uh, he took over. He didn't start SpaceX, right? No, he did. Uh, it was he Tesla did. that he kind of took over. Okay, he so he bought SpaceX. Tesla, took some of the profits, and invested it in uh, space. What was his goal in the beginning at space, SpaceX? So he wanted initially, his whole idea was he wanted to launch a small, basically bell jar experiment to Mars to try and grow a plant. He just wanted to send a little greenhouse to what? Mars. You're kidding. Prove that it could be done. That no, was the I'm whole not. thing? That was where he wow. started. It's like, I want to send a rocket to Mars and grow plants. People said, huh. So he got together <laughs> a guy named Jim Cantrell and a couple of others. They flew over to Russia to talk to the Russian military. And this is, you know, late 1990s and said, we want to buy a rocket. Let, you know, sell us a used IP, ICB or not a used, sorry, a decommissioned ICBM without the warhead. <laughs> They're not as good <laughs> used. Want, no, they have to We say, want to use this to go to <laughs> Mars. And, you know, in theory, it could work if it took the long, slow route. And the Russians didn't take them seriously. And the general they were talking to actually, and I've heard, heard this now from two sources, spat on his shoes and said, get out of my office. Literally? You're an idiot. Spat, yep. Like that. Wow. Out. Oh. Drink more vodka. So they on the plane back, Cantrell and the other guy were kind of licking their wounds, and Elon's in the seat behind them. I suppose still probably flying coach at this point, and he's working on on some plans on a napkin. And he says, "Hey guys, we don't need the Russians. We could do this ourselves." And they're kind of rolling their eyes, going, "Oh, here's, here goes Elon again." And then they looked at the figures and went, "Huh." So th at that point, he got some very smart people, a guy named Tom Mueller, Gwyn Shotwell, who's currently his president. And that's what he's so good at, right, is having this big idea, bringing in these really incredibly smart people and then driving them to the end of their wits to get things done. <laughs> yeah. So that's how it started. And he actually started his rocket company two years later than Bezos did start his rocket company. And what we've seen so far is SpaceX basically dominate 
I mean, literally revolutionized rocketry, dominate the global launch market. If it wasn't for SpaceX, the Chinese would be launching three times as many rockets as we do and make it relatively affordable. And, you know, I like what Bezos is doing, but we keep seeing these factories being built. There's They just finished one at Kennedy a couple of years ago, Kennedy Space Center, and all these trucks of supplies going in the front door, and then we're waiting and nothing's coming out the back. And it's like, where are the rockets, guys? Uh, we that used said, to Bezos have- is is selling his rocket engines to United Launch Alliance for their rocket, which is going to launch, the brand new one's going to launch on Christmas Eve. So he is engaging in co-opetition there. Sorry, we man. used to have uh, a wonderful guy, the late, a great science fiction author, Jerry Pornell, on our shows pretty mm-hmm. regularly. Yeah. Uh, he, he was, was always a strong proponent of uh, commercial space exploration. He, mm-hmm. you know, as a, Wikipedia describes him as a paleo conservative, and I think that's fair. <laughs> but as a paleo conservative, he didn't trust the government to do it. He thought that the, the if you really want to uh, explore space, it's got to be commercial interests doing it, perhaps in in partnership with the federal government. And Elon's, I think, proven him right. Well, he's proven him right by, uh, I mean, initially when he wanted to get Air Force cargo, the Air Force said, nice try, kid, come back when you grow up. This is in the mid 2000s. And so to get his customer, he sued his customer. And wow. His customer said, oh, I guess we notice you now. So they gave him the work. But wow, yeah, that's I an, think an unusual way of getting a job. It's a very unusual <laughs> path to, to what that's you That's so want, Elon, but, isn't it? Well, it is. And and then when NASA was uh, giving out contracts, they wanted to give out a couple of contracts to build a lunar lander for the Artemis program, which is in trouble. And um, Bezos sued because he didn't get the first bid because Musk got it. And as a lot of people pointed out and observed in popular writing, myself included, hey, you, you, you know, you were... Ch- trying to charge twice as much as SpaceX was going to to do this. And he said, yeah, but it's not fair. So now the U.S. government, but there's a lot of stumbling. Now the U.S. government's kind of over a barrel because they owe owe so much to Elon because they've kind of stopped doing so much uh, themselves that Mm -hmm. Elon kind of, he, SpaceX uh, uh, runs Starlink and they pretty much own the, you know, space-based internet. Um, Yeah. It's it's really an interesting conundrum. The government has ceded its role to Elon Musk, and now they're a little afraid. I was well, nervous making my connection back from Vienna to be here for this show. Imagine being an astronaut up in the space station, dependent upon either Elon Musk or the Russians to get back home. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, but you know, uh, but we're not depending on Elon. We're depending on SpaceX. It's a big company. There's a lot of smart people there, and they're the only people that pulled it off. Boeing was supposed to be the other bunch that were going to build capsules to get astronauts back and forth to the space station by 2016, and they still haven't done it once. Not completely successfully. So, and I and I don't want to type too much time, Leo, but I did want to mention one of the stories. Of, of recent months is kind of a big deal, which hinges back on the SpaceX thing is we just got word from the Government Accountability Office, who are pretty good folks, that surprise, surprise, contain your eye rolls. Uh, NASA is not going to make their moon landing date of 2025 that we've all been pretending we believe for the last few years. What's weird about it, It's, it's that's not a shock, because if you grew up during the Apollo years, that was all running late, too. Space but is weird hard. About it is, I, you know, I, it's a well, hard it is, thing to do. But but we're doing Very it a cold. second time, right? Well, that's true. So let's bear in mind. But what's slowing it down mostly, you know, the Orion capsule works, the SLS, big rocket, costs a fortune, but it works. But the lander to get down to the moon, which is supposed to be a different version of Starship, is a pacing item, which is way behind schedule, somewhat because of the government itself, the FAA and Department of Fish and Wildlife not giving permits for him to launch because we wouldn't want to bonk any crocodiles on the head with rocket parts. But the other thing is they're having trouble getting new moon suits built because we haven't built a space suit in this country other than those pressure suits that are just protect you if you get a leak that SpaceX makes. We haven't actually built an EVA suit since 1988. So the ones they're using on the shuttle and the space station today are from the 80s. You're kidding. So that's become this major (laughs) slowdown. And it's like, but wait, didn't you do this before? I saw it in the museum. But we've had so much brain drain in retirement that they're having to start over. And it's a real problem. Uh, It's amazing that the guy who's doing this (laughs) also seems to be 
Well, insane. Uh, at least in his social media. <laughs> Walter presence. Isaacson didn't say he was crazy. He just said he was kind of a an A H. Yeah. Uh, and Isaacson was on his side, and can arguably be said that he was kind of writing a hagiography. So if mm. if Isaacson thought he was an a hole, <laughs> you can only imagine what he really was. Is he is he brilliant or is he just incredibly brash? He's brilliant, brash, and I think at, at times brutal. I, we've yeah. got to get that third B in there. And he loaded. Is a, a brutal and person loaded. to work for. I mean, but you know, yeah, money buys a lot, doesn't it? In the if West. you have vision, or even if it's kind of crazy, and you have billions, uh, things happen. You know, uh, maybe not the best things sometimes, but things happen. But what would drive a person like that to go from, I want to have a backup drive for humanity on another planet, to buying Twitter? I still just don't get that. This is, I, the I know this is Tess Grail. This is the ego gone mad. It's, well, yeah. or, or did he talk himself into it completely by accident just by yeah, sparking did. off he one did. day? That, well, that's he what thinks I he's, get. he's smarter than all the politicians. He's smarter than all mankind. This is part of, of long-termism is that they think they are the, oh, the extreme. They <laughs> think they are the ones to use these resources best yeah. for the future of all humankind. I also think that Elon uh, doesn't have much impulse control, right? We're say, we, I think it's safe saying that. Apparently not. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's really safe. Very, very, impu yeah. very impulsively. <laughs> Made an offer for Twitter, not expecting really that he would get it, Oops. and and then what I think the fascinating story is that Brett, what's his name, Brett last name, uh, Taylor, Taylor, Brett Taylor, who was at the time on the board of uh, Twitter, really interesting guy. He's been at Google. He uh, he started um, was it Friends Friends No, not Friendster. Um, uh, <sighs> another social network. He's a really interesting guy. Uh, basically held Elon's feet to the fire <clears throat> and, mm -hmm. and forced him to uh, live up to his, I think, very ill-planned promise. And Elon had enough money and had enough contacts to be able to get $44 billion together to buy it. I don't think he ever wanted it. And now I, I love that we're... No talking about a Bond villain and Steve is here with his green fingers doing this <laughs> the whole thing. It's like, oh, a little projection going on there. It's a Zeus villain. Uh, <laughs> oh, well played, sir. <laughs> so, so there's it's a... who villain. Th th this may be a uh, useful or may, may not. Something I learned on a podcast. Uh, it was one of the Ringer podcasts where um, Ben Affleck was being interviewed. And I'm not going to get this exactly right, but it's close enough to be applicable um, he said the problem with celebrity isn't just that you lose your anonymity, but you can't trust what you, you can't, you can't totally trust yourself because you're not operating in the same reality as everybody else. Yeah. You're, you're detached. You're, you're not walking the streets with, with the ordinaries and, and interacting with the real world. And I think that's what's happened to this guy. I, I think he's, he's, he's detached. He really, and, and, and I, Part of the evidence to me for that is that it isn't just that he does trolly things on Twitter. It's that he's repeating stuff that are that he's doing no fact checking whatsoever. Just none. He just oh, he's yeah. just yet another right wing troll saying right wing trolls and, and repeating stuff that other people have. You know, he, he, he retweets or re -exes, um apparently, you know, icky stuff without mm -hmm. really checking, you know, and uh, I, that that seems to me like it's 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 weird and it's stupid um and and but i think it's it's because he's detached i think bezos had a similar thing happened i mean jeff i don't know but you, we, we used to go to conferences probably you too um uh uh, uh leo where you'd hang out with jeff bezos he was our he was a nice he was a nice guy he laughed like Pee Wee herman but you know <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> But, anyway, it's but, a but he was like a regular guy, you know, I enjoy talking to him. Not, not much, but he was very approachable, um, you know, sensible. And now he's like, all these guys, you notice too, they all build up their muscles. Zuckerberg's done it, do it, done it too. You know, um, well, they have time, yeah. they have time, it's, they guess, have money and they have vanity. You know, um, and, and I know people who work for meta who just think that, that Zuckerberg is, is also out there somewhere. What he did with the, uh, with the virtual reality is they spend like $40 billion or whatever yeah. it was yeah. and came up with a goose egg, you know, and let us know 
These are all men. We on this panel of men must speak the truth about our gender. We're (laughs) effing up the world. We've done it for centuries. I know. know. It's time to hand it over. (laughs) I agree. I agree. Just end it all. But it also, it's got to be difficult that I'm not defending either of them, but who are they going to turn to for the truth? I mean, at least Bezos might be able to get some some straight pillow talk from from his are they married now they're married right no i don't think so there's a big ring there's a big rock yeah okay i don't know from his wedding from his fiance fiance who the heck would musk be able to ever talk to and who can talk to musk i mean i'm not sure he's the best listener but where do you go to get straight talk when people are either terrified of you or after your favor yeah it's gotta be very tough and it's not at all clear that Elon wants straight talk. Oh, no. I mean, no. He, yeah. he, he's he wants closed to, believe what he wants to, to it. Believe. He really does think that he has all the answers. And, you know, one of the things that we were just talking about, Jeff, you, you were mentioning that it's, you know, men who are running everything and screwing everything up. Um, force of personality goes a long way. There are a lot of people who, you know, they just don't want something bad enough they're not pushing they're not screaming and jumping up and down and having a tantrum and demanding and so when someone like elon does the rest of us go like oh okay you know if you want to go do that that's fine you know so so you know that the the it it very much seems that there's that there's a personality raw personality in addition to yes intellect and upbringing and everything but there is a a, a force that these people have that that is part of their long-term success. Look at Steve Jobs. I, I mean, no one says he yes, was a wonderful perfect example. hang, perfect. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I think the other thing is that, uh, and social media has made this possible, uh, YouTube, overexposure of, of broadcast media and so forth. We're all a little bit of good and a little bit of bad. And... Uh, Maybe yeah. we maybe we just see you know Henry Ford was no hero. Oh my God! Uh, Thomas Edison uh, was kind of a jerk, uh, but we didn't maybe know that as much as we would now. I'll right. bet Gutenberg was a good guy. <laughs> of course, you'd say so. He lasted five hundred years. Yeah. yeah, everybody looks good five hundred yeah. years later. Are you kidding? <laughs> well, I, can I just mention one more thing about Musk? I found it shocking. So I watched that whole hour and 15 minutes i think of that new york times uh stage thing he did where he told his advertisers to go f themselves oh my god and when asked about his hard turn from being center left to uh full right politically he attributed that this is so childish i couldn't believe it he attributed the whole thing to uh, losing face, uh, although he didn't put it that way, because he wasn't invited to the EV fest by the Biden administration. Now, I, I understand that that was because of union factors, and it was not a good thing to do. It was not a smart thing to do for Biden. But really, you're going to completely change your political oh, and social philosophy God. based on one snub? Never underestimate the power of vindictiveness. Look at oh Opp- boy, no! Look at the Oppenheimer movie, oh. which is really all about just about vindictiveness. Strauss, Oppenheimer shows up this guy Strauss at a Senate hearing by saying, "Oh, you you know you can make nuclear bombs out of donuts. You don't need to worry about isotopes." <laughs> Strauss is so humiliated that he basically completely destroys Robert Oppenheimer's reputation uh, in a in a kind of a kangaroo court. It's the, it's really the premise of the movie is how petty vindictiveness can change the world. So never underestimate the power of pettiness. That's my motto. <laughs> if you invest of now, you can it'll pay off. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, maybe we'll take another break before we uh, go on with our Christmas Eve. And I hope you all are with family and friends uh, this holiday season are enjoying it. And we're so glad you could spend some time with us. We like to think of you as our family. The one thing I've learned doing Twit uh, for 15 years uh, is really that podcasts are about community. They're about uh, the people who not just talk, but the people who listen. And one of the things we've always tried to do uh, on Twitter is to listen to you and to really let 
our community be a part of what we do. We're so glad we have you. Uh, as you probably have heard, we've been going through kind of a rough time, as as many others have. Spotify's had three stages of layoffs, as you were talking about, Doc, this year. And some of the biggest podcast networks like Gimlet and the WNYC have retreated. Uh, we want to keep doing what we do. We love what we do. We love you. We love our community. And we think we provide a service uh, that's valuable. And we hope you think so too. So I'd like to invite you, if if you are listening to this and you do value what we do at Twit, to help us uh, continue to do it. Uh, we really, to be honest, I don't want to beg, but we need your help to continue in 2024. There's a very easy way to do it. And I think it's pretty inexpensive. It's $7 a month to join Club Twit. It makes a big difference in our bottom line. And Frankly, for us to survive in 2024, we need a lot more of you who listen to join. Right now, it's just over 1% of our audience. If we could get to 5 or 10% of our audience, we wouldn't have to worry about finances. We could hire more people. We could do more shows. Uh, and I'd like to do that. I really would. So in a way, this is your way of, of voting. If you want to hear more from us, if you like what we do and you want it to continue, go to twit.tv slash club twit. Uh, join Club Twit, $7 a month, $84 a year. There are family plans, there's corporate plans. But your membership makes a huge difference uh, these days to us continuing. And, and we'd like to do that. So if you would. Uh, and thanks in advance. Twit.tv slash Club Twit. We'll be back with more of the old farts. <laughs> Aren't you glad you're listening? <laughs> in just a bit. This episode of our show brought to you by HID Global. This is a great gift you can give yourself this holiday season. Leave the stress of tedious PKI management behind in 2023. Stress less with complete certificate life cycle automation from HID Global's PKI as a service model. You know, Google now is going to require 90-day SSL certificates. Now, I don't know about you, but you, I don't know if I'll remember every three months. But fortunately, HID Global can automate that. HID's model of automation doesn't require any additional hardware or software investments. No installs in order to automate the life cycles of your organization's certificates. Nothing more embarrassing than a lapsed certificate. This way, it happens automatically. Oh, and you'll love this for Google and Mac systems. HID Global's connector model of PKI uses open source certificate utilities. So your organization can use multiple operating systems. That's great for BYOD. Ease your procurement pains. With HID Global, you get up and running in two weeks. That's a lot faster than the competition. And their assistance with deployment always includes their incomparable white glove service, expertise, and knowledge. And, of course, you're going to get ownership of your private keys. HID takes care of your PKI so you can spend your holidays and weekends taking care of yourself, your family, and the things that matter to you outside of work. Let HID do the lifting. HID.link slash twit demo today that's hid dot link slash twit demo thank you hid for supporting our very special holiday episode we're looking back at the year 2023 uh with uh five of us who've seen more than a few years <laughs> go <laughs> go by oh um, god if you added it up it would really depress us uh, several centuries i you know what though um we live in a youth culture, right? Who's the Who's the person of the year this year in Time Magazine? Uh, Taylor Swift, right? Taylor oh, Swift. Taylor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you could argue. <laughs> who said Brittany? Who said <laughs> Brittany? Oh, these yeah. ones. Oh, they all okay, seem Pop. really uh, yeah, keeping up with the times, isn't he? To say. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, that Joni Mitchell, she sure <laughs> shall. <laughs> no, we live in a youth culture, uh, but I think it's really important, especially in, a, in an area that's so fast moving as technology, to have the context that people like us who've really seen the whole thing from the ground up. Doc, you've been at the beginning. I was at the beginning. Uh, Steve, you wrote a light pen interface for the Apple II computer. You were programming PDP-8s in high school. Yeah. I mean, uh, we've been through this. I don't know what you did when you were a kid, Rod, but I hope it wasn't makeup. <laughs> uh, oh, ow, ow. <laughs> uh, yes, fortunately not. Uh, Nothing good. So, but I think, uh, the, and I see this all the time, that, Younger people really have no context for the world they're living in today. 
um, they forget that, you know, yeah. even 10 years ago, in the, in, and this was, by the way, this I, I was reading this in this history of uh, how AI got to where it is today. 10 years ago, we thought a, an online service that could tell whether that was a cat on YouTube was pretty good if it got 16% right. We thought, wow, AI is really coming along. Uh, we've seen a lot. And I think there's some real value to getting together. I hope you think so, too, uh, with, the, uh, with the people who've seen it all. To give you some context uh, of what's uh, what's been, you happening. know, when when Douglas Rushkoff and I taught a course uh, a year ago in, in reinventing the internet, we realized at some point that the students were younger than the web. Yeah, isn't that amazing? And so yeah. Douglas had to, Douglas had and they were master's students, by the way. Douglas had to get, do a, a lecture on you know what was what was chat, what was the early internet, what was a, a, a dial up modem, what was bitmap screens. Yeah. I mean, the, the, is there a value? Is it just nostalgia, Jeff, or is there a value no, to understanding no, because where I think we it, came from? No, this is this is in my next book out next year, The Web We Weave. Uh, what I argue is that's what we want to recapture. Uh, we lost it. We lost it mm. to the in, in certification or corporatization or scaling of of our net. We gave up. You know, some of us didn't. Doc Searles is still an open source, and Dave Weiner is an open source. But schmucks like me said, "Okay, Twitter, I'll I'll move my conversation over there." And what a mistake a that turned out to be! Public didn't discourse, it? yeah, right to be yeah. to be vulnerable. And yeah. so we've got to recapture that early web, that early internet, and its optimism. Not the stupidity. We've learned a lot of lessons since then. You know, no, it doesn't bring democracy to the world. Um, no, it doesn't bring world peace. Yes, jerks will use it in all kinds of ways that we hadn't anticipated didn't build for all that's true nonetheless there's a lot i still believe i'm curious what my fellow old farts think from the early internet that we want to hold on to and remember and recapture and rebuild i i would comment on the optimism so i was studying all this stuff at stanford in 1993 and we were talking about the internet and this thing and of course the demos were all being done on america online but no counting for that. But I remember talking, uh, the, the professor at that time, talking about how this was going to be the greatest expansion of thinking in the public sphere in history. And I kind of stared at him with a soured look. I was a little older than the other students. And he said, what? And I said, capitalism hates a vacuum. Mm. And he kind of looked at me like I was nuts. But by golly, you know, yep. it worked out that way. And I, I, I miss that sense of optimism we had. That was kind of Tim Wu's uh, point of view in the kill switch is that, you know, it's, you know, money's going to end up ruining it. You know, it's it, it always comes along. Um, well, we're taking up the room we leave, right? We, yeah. we left that vacuum there for them to do. Yeah. Um, what other lessons, Steve, have we learned being in this for decades? I, I think some things change quickly and some things change very slowly. I'm astonished by the explosion we've seen in storage capacity. You know, obviously I'm focused on storage, but still, you know, everybody's using storage and it used to be that you were backing up your computer on floppy disks. I mean, we all did at one point. And, and you had a, a, a disk drive that held 10 megabytes was $5,000 when they were first available for the PC. And, and it's just, it's, it, there was a conversation online that I participated in the other day. So where some guy said, well, you know, um, I'm, I want to run a NAS with four 16 terabyte drives and, I don't know if I want to run raid six because then I'll lose half that. It's like, what? Are, what do you need sixteen? <laughs> sixty-four trillion bytes. I said, you know that that's sixty-four thousand gigabytes. What? Are, what are you doing? Well, I want uh, the Library of Congress for every nation on my uh, hard drive. <laughs> I remember reading uh, uh, the wonderful William Gibson's uh, Neuromancer, and there was a computer. In that uh, that had all of the everything ever published, the, basically the Library of Congress, all the world's information on that computer. And I thought at the time, and that was around, it was in the nineties, I think. I thought at the time, wow, you know, that might happen someday. If there is a less, there is one lesson. Uh, things get bigger, faster, and better quicker than you might expect. 
Yeah. The uh, the NSA was building, remember about 20 years ago, started building a giant data facility in the Midwest to store Utah, all yeah. of the telecommunications, all the digital communications. And at the time, it's like, well, fine, have fun in that giant treasure trove. Uh, but what we did not anticipate is the rise of mass storage, uh, high-speed computing, and AI. And now they look like they might have been prescient to save all that because they mm -hmm. can use that now and uh, derive information from that in a way that we maybe didn't anticipate 20 years ago. Um, it, it, it's probably good for us to remember that uh, when we brush away concerns about, you know, surveillance and privacy. Ah, what are they going to do? Security. Um, because it does all get faster and better at a surprising rate. Yeah, yeah. There were stories that we did not <laughs> talk about that were, uh, for their time, big stories. Who remembers the Chinese spy balloon? <laughs> oh yeah. You mean yeah. you mean TikTok? <laughs> that too. What You mean uh, the alien the alien surveillance over the Midwest. Yeah, remember oh, yeah. how much attention there was oh, to the spot and we had we shot them down and and For uh, millions. Yeah. Uh the White House uh you know said well the Chinese are what, uh, did, whatever came of that? Anything, Rod? Was that uh, just as a... There is, uh, from what I read afterwards from the best sources I could find, it was decided that it was not really a surveillance instrument. Uh, they they found enough pieces and said, nah. Just a weather Chinese balloon. actually <laughs> kind of telling the truth this time, we think. Although, uh, you know, th then, of course, the, the, the right jumps on that and says, ah, oh, you're not being honest. And then George Nuri tells us that it's, you know, <laughs> they're putting psychedelics in our crops. So it got very weird. But, you know, and there wasn't just one of those. There was a couple of those things. And it was interesting that uh, I was talking to, a, to an Air Force guy about this. And I said, why is this suddenly lighting on fire? Is it because you guys are, you know, being told by the White House to be on alert? And he said, no, we just didn't look for that stuff before. You know, there's so many mylar It's been going on all along, bags floating we, around. we never paid any attention. That they had to recalibrate their radar, yeah. and then suddenly now they're seeing every little Tom, Dick, and Harry out there and discovered The that. thing that's important, and maybe this is where our context is helpful, is, you know, that could have been World War Three. You know, it's little things like yeah. that that create or first contact yeah. escalated tensions, and uh, if somebody else had been in charge, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ooh, Jeff, uh, who do you mean? I don't know. <laughs> he doesn't need a first alert to hit the button. <laughs> oh. He would just do it for laughs. Uh, yeah. You're talking about the AI, I'm sure. Coke. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, or that's or it. destruction of mankind. Which button is it? <laughs> in March, <laughs> remember the Silicon Valley Bank run. Yeah. Um, remember that? Uh, these are huge stories at the time that have kind of faded off in the distance. Uh, at the time, we thought it might be the beginning of a massive bank failure and, and the onset of another Great Depression. Uh, and yet people are still telling us that's coming. I yeah. just don't see where the yeah. evidence is. Uh, was there any long-term repercussions in Silicon Valley? Uh, I don't think so. I think the FDIC moved in. They, they backed up all the deposits, and that was that. It's, it's, yeah, it was nice to see that machine work as well as it did. Yeah, it? yeah. Uh, this was also the year that the Hollywood writers went on strike, and then oh, the boy. actors went on strike. I think that was just a symptom of something that's been going on for some time and is really coming to a head now, which is uh, the move to streaming. Uh, well, and so interesting that a huge issue for all of them was AI. Right. I mean, that was a big part of their, their contract renegotiation was we need protection from AI. Now, apparently, we don't have to worry about them uh, writing for the uh, nighttime talk shows because AI can't do funny. But, you know, <laughs> well, they could do some Saturday Night Live. Then. Actually, yeah, <laughs> well, a lot of that watching, stuff's not that funny. <laughs> the unfunny and, stuff. Exactly. And watching the studios try and position themselves to own everything, including your DNA, whether you're a writer, a producer, an actor, yeah, a voiceover amazing. person. I mean, those yeah. contracts are so brutalizing and always have been. I think it's just getting worse. But, right. yeah, the AI question is really interesting because... You know, where are the limits? If, uh, could you put a head on this guy that's different? Or could you just change the way he looks or she looks? 
and in ter- and uh, certainly, you know, one of the huge expenses on any film is doing uh, uh, dialogue replacement afterwards. Well, now you can do that without even bringing the actor in, which costs you a fortune. And I and I think that makes a lot of sense. But is it okay? Um, I think also though. And it's a, it's a kind of seems like a less interesting issue. The the real issue was that the way uh, content is distributed changed so dramatically that mm. the pay for the actors had changed because they used to get paid for right. reruns. They used to right. get right. Residuals. Right. residuals. And once it was streaming, yep. they didn't get paid for that. And really, that, I think that was the precipitating uh, event of the strike. And it really uh, is a small part of, of an entire landscape change. That has been brought by technology and the internet over the last uh, ten years. Not it's partly in media, of course, Jeff. Uh, that's that's your area, and, and we were talking about that earlier. But in so many ways, we live in interesting times. Well, and look at YouTube with user-generated content. I mean, I know people who no longer watch television; they spend their life watching YouTube, and that's just so true. Yeah. random people who are, you know, putting, you know, we all have cameras now in our pockets. We can all make movies. Bandwidth is no problem. Storage is no problem. And so now, you know, there's just all this stuff. And, you know, I don't let myself fall into it, but, you know, Google knows me. And when I look down the, the right-hand column at the at the things I could click on, they're really interesting. It's like, wow, that's that yeah. looks cool. I could spend 15 minutes there. And the contract, the content is free to the host, and yet the rates to pay them for us, the public, keep going up. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I mean, well, I'm stunned at how much it costs me now just to crawl back to where cable left off. And, which is and, bad and streaming is not a very good business, as it turns out. Yeah. Because yeah. How is that possible? Because <laughs> we're subscribed out. It must be a decent business because we learned this year, actually just a few weeks ago, that Netflix plans to spend $17 billion in 2024 on new content. So it must on be new depressing things. <laughs> and there's well, and then there's one that... must have. It's sort of like if you're going to have only one, you're going to have that one. Yeah. Yeah. And They're then the there's new this... ABC, CBS, and NBC kind of rolled together. And well, that's the other thing more. is these giants. I mean, you and yeah. I grew up in an era where there were three channels. Uh, there were yeah. three networks and they dominated. And now I don't even know who owns these companies anymore, right? It's mostly cable companies, I think. Viacom well, owns CBS, moment. Comcast owns NBC. There's a terrible moment where you realize, at least on Amazon, uh, Amazon Prime and a couple of the others, when you buy a show or a movie, you're not buying anything. Yeah. You're leasing it until their license expires. And then it. you go back a year later and that your stuff's gone. Happens on Kindle, too. They didn't tell me that. Maybe it was in the fine print somewhere. It's, but they told you, but you just didn't read the entire no, see, EULA. <laughs> lazy. Uh, so I, I watched words. The, you should have read it. Yeah. I, watched, <laughs> I, watched the, I watched the fourth Republican debate last night, and it was on News Nation. That was like, okay. That didn't even exist out. a year ago. The best exactly. we could do. Yeah. 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 You know, Doc, you just make me think that one, one good use for LLMs would be to read EULAs for you. Oh yeah, yeah summarize. That, that's probably a good. That's probably a good one. Yeah. Query, query them. Uh, except oh, that they, really is. Except they just say you're effed. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's pretty much. But I suppose they. You know, that's that's a good one. Um, yeah, here's a, a something I've been thinking about. It's, it's not any news this last year, but it's it's interesting. I'm, I'm thinking about it in terms of Jeff's book too. That um, we thought in the '90s that the internet was a library. And basically, we thought it was a pile of a bunch of Unix paths that went to permanent things. It had a static structure. We spoke about it in static ways. We have domains with locations that we would visit and browse as if they were real. And it turns out it's a whiteboard. And and we we can have. I mean, <laughs> it really nice. is. It's a, it's a yeah, big whiteboard. I love and, that. and yeah, there there's no. Um, you could go out of, out of your way to try and save some of them. I was so grateful that that WordPress and and the Harvard folks worked together to, to reserve my blog. But there's no guarantee these things are forever. They're just not. No. We we don't own our domain names. We rent them, right? And I, I've I've owned I've rented Searles.com since my last name.com since 1995. But I have no faith that my heirs will keep that up, right? They may not. You know, I've got a pile of stuff there. Um, but where's that there? And my, my my wife thinks in 500 years or a thousand years, they'll look back at this period as like, 
we don't know what happened then, <laughs> you know, because yeah. they digitized everything spot, and it yeah. went into big data centers and so forth, but then they failed. And, um, uh, and then and now we don't know. We it's don't actually know an there. interesting yeah. paradox. On the one hand, we have more information about what happens every minute of every day, more video, more audio, more inf It's just flowing like crazy. But on the other hand, it's completely ephemeral. And uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's ephemeral and it looks static, but it's not. Yeah. So, um, so, Doc, when I talked to Elizabeth Eisenstein, who is credited with creating oh, she's great. the yeah. field of book, book history, um, it was actually for a prior book. But she made fun of my floppy disks and, and my electronic stuff. And she said, Gutenberg's Bible is far, will, has already far outlasted anything that you could store yeah. your stuff on. Yeah, put it on yeah. papyrus right. if you really want it to last. Parenthesis withstanding, there's still Actually, some around. Yeah. No, papyrus yeah. falls apart. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Paper's no, not that friend of mine much was better. At the, at, yeah, yeah. A friend of mine was at the Clay Shirky thing at Indiana University. That's where we did this. Was also there to visit a Gutenberg Bible that's there. Yes. Or, yes. You know, so they're like, did Clay come in to Indiana them. for this? Did he fly he, in? Did he? Yeah, he flew in. Oh, wow. He flew in. God, I wish yeah. I could. I can't wait to watch that. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he's so good. Who is your person of the year? If it's not Taylor Swift this year, <laughs> and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a person. I actually really was sure that time magazine would say AI. This was definitely 2023 was yeah. the year AI exploded onto the scene. Well, and when it's in control of Time Magazine, it can appoint it, itself. <laughs> yes. It's going to really be pissed off, I can tell you. Uh, any other? Yeah. What other uh, candidates do we have for the most important trends or, or people or uh, ideas of the year? I mean, I think AI is a clear, oh, uh, clear winner. Well, in, a, in a Christmas Carol tradition, I vote for the ghost of Elon Musk past. <laughs> Back before he was, he was I, nuts. I, I think, you know, Elon could easily have been the person of the year. Because remember, it doesn't have to be a hero. It's just somebody who is uh, significant. Oh, I would say that, except that I'm afraid that yeah. the general public, Twitter's irrelevant to 99% wow. of the world. Uh, they don't, SpaceX... <laughs> I mean, they sell a lot of Teslas. SpaceX is, I, I, I have a friend in Alaska whose life is saved by space, by Starlink. Starlink. Yeah. Um, yeah. Starlink is miraculous. In yes. Some ways. And yet you know, a great astronomers disappointment. don't like it. Yeah. You know? and, I thought, but, I mean, um, well, that's why Elon got kind of the FCC approval to do this crazy thing because, and I, I really believe this was the case. Uh, this was a mission to bring internet access to every corner of the planet. But it turns out, no, <laughs> you got to have a lot of money to internet access to people that have a thousand dollars for the rig, right. and then what, one hundred and fifty dollars a month? Yeah. It's pricey. Yeah. You, you although, remember, although third world rates are much lower. Do you think that the we're subsidizing yeah. the use of uh, of Starlink elsewhere? I hope so. Well, supposedly, possibly. That's why I think that was but, the rationale for giving him all those uh, satellites in the sky. He you remember uh, Meta's? Well, then Facebook's. Um, Drone, uh, oh, huge yeah, solar powered <laughs> drone, thing. scary drone, <laughs> yeah. And then Google's, Google's, uh, Loon Project Loon, yeah, yep. Mm. Um, yeah, I thought space, I thought Starlink had really kind of licked it, like, oh, this is gonna work, it's gonna be great. It is surprisingly fast for satellite internet, latency is not bad. So, I, I think bus qualifies for both good and bad reasons, yeah, like equally good. Oh, well. I, I will say that Boston Dynamics continues to astonish us with what its robots are able to do. Oh, those are I mean, amazing. They're now yeah. dancing yeah. around and doing, you know, gymnastics. And it's just, it's, again, amazing how that technology the, has the, moved. The headless dog was pretty scary, though. Yeah. Well, and that, to me, that is exactly, I mean, if it, I am not a doomer when it comes to AI, but AI is really only <laughs> dangerous to humans if you give it agency, if, if physical agency in the real world. Right. Combine right. AI with with a robotic dog, and <laughs> now you got something. Uh, carrying uh, weapons. Yeah, carrying weapons. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm having trouble, uh, and I I have to confess this is on YouTube, but I'm st it's getting to the point where trying to discern between the real Boston Dynamics footage 
and the parodies that have the robots turning around and shooting their masters or kicking them <laughs> or <laughs> knocking the, hitting them with a two by four or something. They're very entertaining a year ago, but now they look really good. This is uh, the latest industry. version uh, robot from uh, Boston Dynamics, the 2023 edition of Atlas. Um, oh, and they re it is really getting uh, kind of amazing. Uh, and Could I you imagine seeing that guy kicking in your door? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, mean, and I have to think the police agencies, it, we, you know, with a reasonable um, point of view that, well, this will save police lives, are yeah. looking at this kind of thing. I mean... This is terrifying. <laughs> it's climbing yeah, up. It's know, jumping it's, around. It's amazing. You know it has almost infinite strength. Wow. Uh, Look at that. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's next to a human. Yeah. Yeah. So when you, and again, you combine right. that with uh, AI uh, and and perhaps it, you know ideas of its own, and <laughs> I think that's wow. a little bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little no, terrifying. Um, so, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to have nightmares. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Uh, I thought maybe this would be the, the, the year that China became more important. In fact, in, in a way, I think it's become less important, despite yeah. the balloons. Yeah. Uh, of course, this was this was the year that all the tech companies did their best to move their uh, manufacture out of China. But it's going to take a long time, and maybe it won't happen at all once we lose interest and move on. I think I saw a story today that Alibaba is um, diminishing. Yeah. yeah. In terms of revenue or footprint um, or what? Probably that's Timu uh, taking over because there's a new... Chinese uh -huh. uh, site like Alibaba called Timu that is very Wall Street Journal once changed. unstoppable yeah. Alibaba is now faltering interesting it lost oh. its lead even in online shopping yeah China's struggling economically thing. a little bit which is surprising oh yeah yeah I mean, none, none of these uh, Microsoft is going to take over the world uh, friend feed was was it I mean none of these companies is forever I, mean, I would include Google and certainly meta in that now, I was never a VR fan, but I think there's probably a few people who thought last year this would be the year of VR. Maybe people think <laughs> next year with Apple's no, Leo, Vision the, Pro. It was the year of the NFT. How quickly you forget. <laughs> oh, the NFT. It's actually the year of the RV. It's the RV. Is it? Is, that's better than VR yeah, is yeah. the RV. It's, 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 old people like us getting an RV and going off and living in the So how did, how did Facebook get their, their year of, of, uh, of VR so wrong? Or there are a few years of VR. I mean, I you were talking easy, earlier about that well, investment. Did, did, that's did, one did thing they that just we, listen to their own Zuck was smoking his own exhaust. That's what happened. Yeah, yeah, when you have that much success, you can go wrong so many ways. But yet did, again, once yeah. again, his stock is doing just fine. Did you yeah, all at any point think VR was the next big thing? No. No. No, we were all skeptical. It's so intoxicating for about 10 minutes. For 10 minutes, that's the problem. And then now, even without a headache, I mean, other than, than using it for workouts with, with uh, Supernatural, which I really liked, the other stuff, and I'm not a gamer, I confess, but the other stuff. No, I am. And it's I not. mean, the idea that people are going to sit in a virtual movie theater mm -hmm. and eat virtual popcorn and, you know, see the virtual guy in front of you looking on his virtual cell phone while you're trying to watch the virtual movie never made sense. But I'm an old guy. So what do I know? So Has anybody played with the Apple ones that have so, the weird eyeballs? Yeah. So so that's <laughs> really in a way the segue. Apple had a became a three trillion dollar company this year and wow. spent a good amount of cash and probably the last ten years, we'll never know because Apple's very secretive, working on Vision Pro, which is not exactly VR, it's really augmented reality. Uh they believe clearly that that that's the next big thing. Have they did they drink Mark Zuckerberg's Kool-Aid? An astonishing amount of technology in that thing. I mean, it's just... It's, it's an amazing technology it's demonstration. It's astonishing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yet, I don't see people buying it, certainly not it, at the who price. Who wants one? Who yeah. wants one? Well, yeah. So, Steve, what was the most astonishing thing about it to you? Well, just, for example, the idea that they're going to... They're going to put screens in front of you, then they're going to put outward-facing cameras... They're going to take the they're, they're they're going to do all the work of feeding that video image through, so then they can overlay 
anything they want to on the outside. Then they went to the extra trouble of putting screens on the outside so that they showed you fake eyeballs so that <laughs> th th after they took pictures of the person using it so that it looked like the person looking through the glasses. I mean, it's just like so far over the top. It's over the so top. The guy with the green fingers. Yeah. It's it's it, no, it's an amazing tour de force in technology for yes. a market that does not exist. Yeah. And yes. and yeah. I I suspect will never exist. Uh you really have so you to You don't be think a true they can believer. build their own market? No. This Nobody wants this. I I don't maybe it's just me, but I think of putting something like that on my head and trying to compute mm -hmm. and it makes me vaguely nauseated. It's not pleasant. It's not. It is the case that, that a lot of companies invest a whole lot of money in R&D that never sees the light of day. Yeah. And, you know, this could be that. Although I now live on my tablets and they didn't exist yet. You know, once upon a time, you know, there was no iPad. And now I'm, you know, I have them in every room because I don't want to carry them around. It is interesting. So if they get this Go down ahead. to the size of a pair of Ray-Bans with that kind of, you know, some vaguely similar AR display. Would that do it for you? Oh, yeah. But well, what about what about the the new glasses? The Ray-Ban uh, uh, meta yeah, collaboration? Much, yeah. you, w Mike Elgin was on Twig, I think, right? Uh, with us, or maybe it was on Twit and was singing. Yeah, I think it was on Twitter. was singing their praises. He loved them. He got me this close to buying them. Uh, but I know better. <laughs> <laughs> when, when are you oh, getting sure. your? What are you getting your stupid thing that you wear that has the laser and the on your? Oh, hand the recall it? or whatever it's called. Re no, re the other one. Oh, rewind the thing you hang. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to get the no. uh, silly ta the silly uh, brooch. Oh, I thought you were going to buy it. He said he was. Yeah, he said he was. He I buys heard him everything. during my walk Leo, while Leo, I was walking my dog. At not following through. That's good. He's, That's he's, really good. <laughs> you know, he's the, Mikey, the secret of aging. I, I know what's going to happen. In a couple of months, I'll be on. It'd be three in the morning. I'll be scrolling through Instagram and I'll say, oh, that'd be cool to have. And I'll push a button. Uh, but until then, <laughs> they're going to have to get me with my guard. Good for down. you. Good what for is you. the big story going to be in 2024? I want to hear from all of you. Rod, what is the what is what is coming oh, that we should pay first. attention to? I have to say uh, another story from this year that we didn't really talk about: the amazing images we got from the James Webb Telescope, mm -hmm. and uh, and from uh, the, uh, the, the that's our person of the year. I I, I, I vote for the James Webb. Absolutely, uh, that's actually a good one. I was going to say Apple, but I think you're right. The James Webb. I think the big story for 24, if they make it in November, is going to be. Uh, a sort of quasi repeat of the flight of Apollo eight. That would uh, be amazing. So Artemis two is intended to fly past the moon in 20 uh, at the end of 24. It's not going into orbit. So on the one hand, if you're a space historian, you're going, this isn't even Apollo eight. And they threw that together in about six months because we were desperate. We thought the Russians are going to beat us in a flyby and we didn't want them to steal our thunder. But you know what? We're going back. It's going to be four people multinational, multi-ethnic crew, both genders. So that'll be great. And I think for a whole new generation, that'll be really inspiring in the way it was for us. Actually, it's interesting you mentioned that because this is the 65th anniversary of the Apollo 8 Christmas Eve message. That, uh, 55th. 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 It so moved yeah. me. I'll play that uh, oh at the God. end of the show. Yeah. Uh, we can listen to a little bit of, uh, of that incredible uh, Christmas Eve message from the first manned mission to the moon. Frank Bourne, and then they got Jim in trouble Lovell. because they read from Genesis. They read from the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I think that if you're ever going to read from the Bible, being the first humans to to orbit the moon, the moon gives you some license, license to do that. So I like that. So we'll look ahead to well, uh, uh, the fall of next year for the return to the moon. I, I like I just that. One, one quick reminder of that 1968 mission. As I said, it was thrown together pretty quickly because the Russians were making noises about, hey, we're going to loop the moon. We don't need to land there. But there was a, single, a number of single points of failure, one of which being, as you recall, the lunar module wasn't ready. So they went out there with the Apollo capsule with that one rocket engine that put it into lunar orbit and had to break it out of lunar orbit to get it home and had that thing not fired with that one igniter done. They would have still been there. Amazing. Yeah. What a that's courage. It's uh that's that's the thing when we talk about the failures and the you know Artemis problems and so forth. It's really hard to do that. And the fact yeah. that we did it in nineteen sixty nine with the most primitive of computer technology 
is uh, is really a testament to uh, it was amazing. Our, our it's drive. hard to believe it worked as well as it did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The further from it I get, the harder it is to believe it actually all worked out. You wrote a great did. book uh, on the fiftieth anniversary of Apollo Eleven. Highly recommended coffee table book. Uh, what's it called? First on the moon. First. First on the moon. First on the moon. Yeah. Apollo Eleven experience. Beautiful yeah. book. And yeah. I it have was a lot of fun. Uh, on my wall at home, um, a picture of that uh, lunar module landing computer, which was it looked like it was oh, hand yeah. soldered. Uh, <laughs> it probably was <laughs> kind of an amazing uh, thing. Steve, well, what we about were just off of vacuum tubes at that point? Yeah, right. That, that's yeah, also right. astonishing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's Sorry, the famous. What is it? The famous error that twelve oh two and twelve oh one. Yeah, the reboot loop. Yeah. Wow, what a story. Yes. Steve, what do you think 2024 has in store for us? Well, um, my question is sort of a meta answer. Uh, I don't mean meta the company. I It feels to me as though the, the level of chaos that exists is increasing rather quickly. And, you know, chaos is a weird thing. You, you can have your faucet dripping slowly and almost all of the drips go down and you know land and that's it but somehow about a yard off to the one side is a, you know is a drip that you know like the the dripping faucet did that because of chaos and of course needless to say we have an election year in 2024 so you know who's is going to be the next president of the United States that's uh, uh talk about chaos is a is a is a big question we have, but I would argue that we probably have no idea today as a consequence of just the level of, there's no better word than chaos. I don't think we have any idea what it's going to be next year. It will be something completely unexpected. Like something that. will happen yep. in the same way that AI did this year. Nobody saw it coming and it wham, you know, now, you know, suddenly Jeff Jarvis of all people is an expert on AI. Who could have seen that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably true in 1880. If somebody said, well, what's 1881 going to be like? You had a pretty good idea, right? Yeah. There wasn't a lot of surprises around the corner and the chaos is accelerating and the unpredictability. What's Elon going to do? Yeah. Who knows? We just don't know. So I, I like that. That's very interesting. Doc, what, what's your prognosis for next year? Oh boy. I, I think, I mean, if you think, look at what did 21 tell us about 22? What did 22 tell us about 23? Yeah. Um, I, I actually think, I, I know we try to avoid politics, but I think in, inevitably the election next year in the U S is going to be very meaningful. Yeah. Um, and it's not, and I, I have no predictions about it. I don't want to have predictions about it, but I think it's going to be, it'll be, it'll be a big deal. It'll be a big deal. And I don't know how much is going to drive things, but um, an awful lot of policy got made in this last couple of years, in the last several years that are, um, and there've been some successes. Uh, there've been some failures, that, but I think it's, um, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's going to be wild. I, 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 I'm always, it's, it's so weird. I'm, I, I'm an optimist by nature. I, I just think things are going to get better. Um, even though we're all old and we're going to die. <laughs> so, Sometimes uh, I hope I die I, before it gets too bad, but, uh, yeah, that, that's only, yeah. that's only in my darkest but, hours. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I, I actually, I'm, I'm expecting good things. I, I have a lot of optimism about, um, yeah, I, I sort of, all that stuff that Corey wants, I think we're going to get some of it, you know, more general purpose computing. I think open source is going to be fine. It's going to get better in certain ways. I mean, cause more Corey's amazing because you might think he'd be a pessimist. And in fact, he's absolutely an optimist. Uh, and yeah, it, I, yeah. Well, we've yeah, got to, and, these demands that we take charge of things. We've got, yeah. we've got to yeah, make our own I, 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 I think that, I mean, I, I have a lot of hope and faith in the younger generations. And as Jeff brought it up earlier, I mean, it is time to hand things over to women more and more and more and more. I mean, we're, we're, it's not just that men are screwing things up. It's just so lopsided. It's wrong. I mean, and this is industrial hangover that we're still in. That's why we're here and there aren't women here. Um, it's like using 5% of your brain. 
Uh, yeah. Why yeah, would like we waste your, this resource? In the defending your life movie. You yeah, know, the, yeah. 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 I agree. Jeff, wrap this up for us. Uh, you, you old philosopher, what's 2024 uh, going to bring us? Yeah. I don't make predictions because they're BS. There, there's, there's, yeah. there's no way. I mean, we can, we can guess that oh, Twitter could die. Um, LLMs could be seen as the um, uh, be all and end all of humanity, or it could be seen as a parlor trick that gets gets forgotten. I don't think AI will get forgotten. I think AI is now in the public consciousness, but I think LLMs are not going to be the uh, uh, the thing that everybody yeah. concentrates on. Eh, who knows? I can. I think we. That's a good I think one. One thing we can absolutely say, and I think I like what you said, Steve, about chaos, is that we will be in interesting times, and a lot is changing very rapidly. And one thing I can promise you is we will be here to cover it, to talk about it with these brilliant minds and all the others who make such a difference uh, day in day out on our uh, Twit programming. I really want to thank you, Rod Pyle, and this week in space and. Uh, and, and Steve Gibson from Security Now, um, Doc Searles from Floss Weekly, and Twig's Jeff Jarvis. It's I feel like I'm in good company with some of the best and the brightest. And, thank and you. us with you. Thank well, you. So thank much. you for having us. Yeah, it's your you know, good company that we're all in. It. Thank yeah. you for it. Merry yeah. Christmas, everybody. Have a wonderful holiday season. We'll be back <laughs> next Sunday. Jingle your bells next Sunday with a best of on New Year's Eve. I leave you now on this Christmas Eve with 55 years ago, the uh, crew of Apollo 8, the first manned mission to the moon, with that spectacular view in the distance of the Earth uh, and rising above the moon. Frank Borman, uh, Jim Lovell, and uh, William Anders and uh, their Christmas Eve message. Good night, everybody. Happy holidays. We'll see you next time. Another twit is in the can. <laughs> We're now approaching uh, Lunar Sunrise, and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth, and the Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Merry Christmas, everybody. Amazing.